Hello guys, so it's been again quite a while since I last posted a video and I've just been busy with school and stuff and you know everyone was sick recently as well you know because I don't know I guess the weather is just like that so anyways today we are doing 9701 chemistry May June 2015 paper 1 2 all right so let's start I love MCQ papers because I guess so use the data booklet is relevant to this question. I have a data booklet over here. Okay. So in which option do <coughs> all three particles <coughs> have the same electronic configuration and the same number of neutrons? So I'll just go down to the periodic table. Excuse my coughing, as I mentioned. You know, I was sick. So yeah. So let's look at nitrogen. So nitrogen it has seven protons, so that's its atomic number. So that means that if they're asking about the same, like you know, if it has seven protons, that means it would have seven electrons in the neutral atom. But since it has a three minus charge, that means it has seven plus three electrons, which means it has ten electrons. And how many neutrons does it has it have? It has fifteen, which is the total mass number. Minus seven, which is the proton number. So the total mass number minus proton number gives you the neutron number, obviously, right? So that's eight. So it has eight neutrons, okay? And oxygen, oxygen has eight protons, which means that since it has a two minus charge, so eight plus two is ten, so it has ten electrons. And sixteen minus eight is going to be eight neutrons, right? So then we're going good. Then fluorine, it has nine protons. So then nine and then a negative one charge means nine plus one, ten electrons. Okay, and then 19 minus 9 is actually 10 <coughs> new <coughs> neutrons, right, right? So this can't be the answer because we have to have the same electronic configuration for all three elements and the same number of neutrons, okay? Now, if you look at oxygen, again, so, and, but this one, this is a different isotope of oxygen because it has a different um, mass number. So it does have 10 electrons because it also has a 2 minus charge, which actually I think what is the most common charge for oxygen, right? I think, and then so it has 10 electrons, but then 18 minus 8 is 10 neutrons, right? Fluorine here is the same uh, isotope as well, and it's an ion, so 19 9F minus. So, fluoride, I should say, that was But anyways, it has 10 electrons and 10 neutrons, okay? Then neon, it is, where is neon? Okay, so it has 10 on. Um, uh, protons and it has no charge that means it has 10 electrons as well and 20 minus 10 is 10 neutrons i mean i have already got my answer haven't i i don't really need to check the other options but if you want to you know check them on your own you can but you know i'm just going to directly say that the answer is B. okay next question <laughs> the shell of a chicken's egg makes up five percent of the mass of an average egg an average egg is a mass of 50 grams. So what does that mean? How much is the mass of, you know, the shell? Then? If it's the, the average egg has a mass of 50 grams, then 5% of 50 is going to be 5 over 100 to 50, right? Which is going to be, this is going to be 1, 2, so 5 by 2, which is going to be 2.5 grams. So the, the shell of an average egg basically has a mass of 2.5 grams, okay? Now, assume that the egg shell is pure calcium carbonate, which is CaCO3. So how many complete chicken's eggshells would be need to neutralize 50 cubic centimeters of 2 mole per cubic centimeter um, ethanolic <laughs> acid? So let's write down the equation. CaCO3 plus ethanolic acid is CH3. COOH <coughs> gives you or yields uh, C, because actually if you think about it, Ca is 2 plus charge, uh, you know, group 2. And then CH3, COO minus ion has a negative charge, so then it becomes Ca, CH3, COO, <coughs> twice, which remember, remember the group IGC is going to the group form the equation, so here CH3, COO, twice, so that's the product we will get to solve. <laughs> Alright, and then, oh, since there's a carbonate, we also get carbon dioxide and water. Now, if you have uh, two of the CH3, COO minus, that implies that we have two of the ethanoic acid as well, right? CH3, COO, now, is it a balanced equation? Well, we have 2H on this side, 2H there, 3 oxygen, 
um, you know, other than the safe use of HIV, then she will be in the air, and then we have C, C. Okay, it looks to me like it's a balanced equation. So this is going to be my equation, okay? And now, what do we have to do? Well, they have given us that, you know, the um, CH3COH, uh, I'm just going to arrow better weight, sorry. Okay, so then, give me a few centimeters of 2.0 <coughs> moles per cubic meter, right? So what's going to be the moles of FMA gap? What are going to be the moles of FMA gap? It's going to be concentration times the volume, right? So it's going to be 50 cubic centimeters times 10 to the power minus 3 to make it into cubic decimeter because, like, CM is, like, you know, C, centi means 100, and DM, that's in this 10. So if you want to convert from DM to CM, you basically because 10 to 100, right? So you double multiply by <coughs> factor of 10. CM to DM, you uh, multiply by factor of 10 to power minus 1, or basically divide by factor of 10. Now, CM cube to DM cube means instead of 10, you get 1,000, right? Like this factor. Just time, make it 10 to the power of 3. So then this becomes you divide by 10 to the power of 3 or 1,000. And this side, um, wait a minute, this right. C uh, uh, DM to DM to CM so we multiply by a factor of ten to the power of three. Okay, so that is what you do. And uh, I don't know why I went on a rant about that. I just that's one of my favorite rants actually. But anyways, so the point is you can go from CM cube to DM cube to meter to decimal cube to decimal just by multiplying by ten to the power of minus three. Okay? And so you know. Get a unit says dm cube then, and then um, what should we do? We should multiply by 2.0 moles per cubic decimeter. And you know the unit stands to get the units in moles. And so what? Like uh, where's my? Oh my God! Where's my calculator? I'll, I'll just a second. I'll, I'll get my calculator. I think it's still in my bag. And then you can have to do. Okay, back on screen. All right, I got the calculator. 15 million from minus 3 into 2. And you get 0.1 moles. Okay, so you have 0.1 moles of ethanoic acid. Now, if you use molar ratio, then, you know, 2 is, so two is to 1 molar ratio. So if ethanoic acid is 0.1 moles, then calcium carbonate will be 0.1 divided by 2. How many moles is that? It's 0.05, is it not? Yeah, it's 0.05 moles. Okay, so you get 0.05 moles of ethanoic acid. Now, since we found the mass of an average egg, what we can, of a shell of an average egg, what we can do is either convert this 2.5 grams to moles, or you can convert this 0.05 moles to grams. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'll convert the 0 0.05, 0 0.05 moles to grams. So then that becomes, you know, M equals N times MR. Now, if I find out the MR of calcium carbonate, so CA is, uh, calcium is 40.1. So 40.1 plus carbon is 12 plus oxygen 16 times 3. Um, I don't really don't care about writing 12.0, 16.0 for paper 1 because paper 1 you really just have to, you know, fill the bubble sheet. You don't need to show all your working. <laughs> just to, you know, cross check, I would say, maybe you good working, but, you know, you have a time restraint is the point, okay? So it's it 100.1, okay? So n is <coughs> 0 0.05 times 100.1. So that becomes 5.00. 5 grams okay now this is the mass i got um for the eggshells from the you know equation but then the average egg it has a 2.5 gram mass right so <coughs> if i divide 5.005 by 2.5 then i'll get how many eggs i got so like the total mass of all the eggshells used and the mass of one eggshell that would give me the number of eggshells i used right or you could you know use again i, I told you that you could convert this average eggshell mass to moles 0 0.05 divided by whatever answer you told, right? But I'm kind of doing this method. <coughs> so I get 2.002 grams. I guess it's because I used 100.1, but, you know, if you just... <coughs> basically, 5 over 2.5 is 2. So this is... Sorry, not grams. It should actually be a, a number, right? So it's basically 2 eggshells, right? So the answer is going to be B, okay? Next question now. Phosphorus forms a compound with hydrogen called phosphine ph3 so ph3 if you look at you know group 5 you'll see that phosphorus is there right and above it is nitrogen so just I, i'm assuming that you know ph3 like phosphorus will obviously have a lone pair and i think it will be similar structure to nh3 right 
This compound can react with hydrogen ion H plus, just like an H3 reacts with H plus to give you an H4 plus. So whatever what type of interaction occurs between pH 3 and H plus? So if, if I draw it out for you, then it's kind of like this, right? You have pH 3, and this is, you have a you know, lone pair on pH 3, and H plus, it doesn't have any electrons. So what, what happens is that this um, phosphorus, it donates its uh, electrons to the H plus, and then, you know, it still has these other three bonds, with the other three hydrogens. So, and then it becomes, because of the H plus, it becomes a total overall positive charge, because, you know, both sides of the equation have to have the same charge, so it's plus on the, this side of the equation, and it should be plus on this side of the equation as well, right? So, <laughs> that's, that's why. And, so what type of interaction is this? Well, you see, I represent it with an arrow from the lone pair to the edge. So that means this a data covalent bond. That's how we represent data covalent bonds. Dipole type of forces, it's not a force, it's a bond. Hydrogen bond, again, it's not a force. It's, 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 this is not a force, this is a, this is a bond, right? It's kind of a hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding, all of the names, this bond is actually a force. An ionic bond, ionic bond, what do I mean? <coughs> again, this is not <coughs> an ionic bond, it's actually within the covalent molecule, so it is covalent bond, okay? So just, yeah. Now, which, next question, question number four, which solid has a simple molecular lattice? Calcium chloride, well, that's CaF2, obviously you have Ca2 plus and 2F minus, and that is, you know, ionic, so it cannot be simple molecular lattice, can it? Nickel, that's Ni, it's a metal, so it's going to have a, meta, you know, um, a metallic bonding, basically, and so it doesn't have a simple molecular lattice, right? Now, silicon 4 oxide, that's SiO2, it has gi it's a giant covalent macromolecule, molecule, so, you know, it has a molecular that's sure, but not a simple one, a, a giant one, you know, so that's not the answer. But sulfur, sulfur is S, it's a non-metal, and it's not in group 4 or anything. It's, it's got a simple molecular lattice for sure. So that, that, that's the answer. So where is your answer? Okay. Next question. Use the data booklet as relevant to this question. The gas loss in some version of the IT gas equation below PV equals NRT. Oh my God, this beautiful, beautiful equation that's so useful and simplifies life so much. All of a sample of methane is measured to be to add a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. So for 60 degrees Celsius for the equation, we're supposed to convert it into Kelvin. So that's going to be 60 plus 273, which is 333 Kelvin. <coughs> and a pressure of 103 kilopascals. Again, for the equation, we're supposed to convert it to um, Pascals. So 103 times 1,000, which is obviously 103,000 Pascals. The volume measured is 5.3 times 10 power minus 3 cubic meters. It's already in cubic meters, so no need to convert it. Now assume the gas because it's an ideal gas. That's one of my favorite assumptions. Okay. Now what is the mass of the sample of methane given to two significant figures? So we know that n equals to m over m r, right? So if there, you know, in this equation we have n. So instead of n, we can write m over m r because we're supposed to find the mass, right? So we have to have a mass term in the equation. I, yeah, I like to do it like this. Or you could separately find the moles first and then substitute that into the equation. But I prefer to just substitute the variables into the equation and then rearrange the equation and then input you know any values you know that's what i like to do so anyways um now we can rearrange it to be pv times mr and then this becomes over rt equals to m okay that's the equation i get now substitute my values in methane how much is the mr of methane ch4 to this 12 plus Four times, like I mean, one times four to one to be. I don't know what my mother, but my brother recently taught me a word, but that pedantic. So it means care about details too much, yeah. But anyways, it's sixteen um, grams per mole. So what I would use pressure is hundred three hundred three thousand pascals times the volume, which is five point three seven into ten to the power of minus three cubic meters, and the MR is sixteen. And the, um, the value of R, I, I, the data bullet, I think, is given as 8.31. Although, if you want a more accurate value, it's 8.34. Actually, there are different versions of R, but it you know, um, depends on what units you're using for the equation. The equation. <coughs> There's some, something involving TOR, and I don't, I don't remember all the terms, but anyways, this one is in Joe's per Kevin. So, 8.31 <coughs> times the temperature, which is. 
and I'm gonna find the answer. Five point three seven ten to the <coughs> minus three sixteen divided by eight point three one and two hundred and three. So I get three point one nine eight. And the question they're asking you to find it to two seven so that approximately becomes three point two grams, which is option D. So option D is going to be my answer. Okay. Next question. Question number six. Metal dehyde, CH3CHO4, is uh, used as a uh, photoanalyzing. It's a solid fuel for camping stoves. It's equal to the complete combustion of met metal dehyde. This is a delta H C, right? <coughs> now, which expression will give a value for the enthalpy change of formation of metal dehyde? So, if they're saying formation, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write C here, O2, H2. I mean, obviously, C solid. And I'm writing them in their natural states, plus O2 gaseous plus H2 gaseous yeah, available, that's all I have in this product. And I'm going to make arrows here, and I'm going to write the entire to the things that are formed in the above situation, right? So, so over here, obviously, you can't form oxygen gaseous from oxygen gaseous because that's not really an enthalpy change, is that point? So we're just going to talk about CH3, CH4 times on the um, left-hand side. So I should probably write the strike metric equation here too. So, sorry, 2... And then times four, so that becomes eight. So we have eight carbons. And then oxygen is ten O two. So this is going to be ten. Mm, I should know. Wait. Wow. Wait. So it's eight times two is sixteen. And then on this side is sixteen plus eight, so that's going to be twenty four. So uh, twenty four means twelve O two. Am I right? So this is going to be twelve. And hydrogen. Is eight times two sixteen, so this is going to be eight <coughs> H two. All right, so that is my um stoichiometric stoichi coefficients. And now what I'm going to do is okay. So I have one mole of the CH three CHO four form here. So basically, it's going to be going to be the formation of one mole of <coughs> CH three CHO four. Okay, and now. Over here, I have 8 of carbon dioxide form. So I'm going to say it says 8 times my enthalpy change of formation of CO2, okay? Plus 8 times the enthalpy change of formation of H2O, because I got H2O as well, right? So this is my Hess's cycle. And now what they want is the value for the enthalpy change of formation of methane. You can Choose any two arrows that start and end at the same, any two routes that start and end at the same, you know, points. I'm going to choose one as this route and the other one you know, route like this, okay? So now if I look at this one, so this is my enthalpy change of combustion of the, you know, I'm just going to say it is, uh, yeah, CH3. Let's just try the whole thing, who cares? So this is going to be this. So, <coughs> let me write down my, the two routes again and equate them to each other. So, enthalpy change of combustion of CH3, CHO. Four, okay, equals to. I'm going against the direction of the arrow, right? For this route, um, you know, I start at this point and then I end at the same point. Right? That's what I was trying to say. But I'm going against the direction of the arrow, so it's going to be minus enthalpy change of formation of CH3 CHO4. Okay, and then I'm going with the direction of the arrow over here, so this will be plus eight times enthalpy change of formation of the CO2 and Eight times the enthalpy change of formation of H2O. Okay, so now since I want the enthalpy change of formation of the metal dehyde, so I'm going to shift this to the right hand side, or you know, actually, in, in more correct mathematical language, I'm basically adding this thing to both sides, right? So it cancels out on this side, this equals minus and plus to the same thing, to zero, to the zero. Then again, uh, anyways, <laughs> I'm talking about math, I guess, here too much math. CH3, CHO4. Okay, uh, equals to, um, and I'm going to shift this to the left hand side. So it becomes 8 times enthalpy change of formation of CO2 plus 8 times the enthalpy change of formation of H2O minus delta HC CH3 CHO4. Okay, so that is what I get. Sorry. So that is what I get. So now let's see which of op the option has this. We have to have a negative. Enthalpy change of combustion, so I don't have that in A or B, so A and B are out. Now I have that in B and C. And then B and C, what's the difference is that 8 and 8, 8 and 16, but I got 8 for both, so I would say that 
D is wrong as well, and C must be the right answer, okay, because that matches with the equation I got, right? If you put the brackets as well. So, so the C is going to be my answer. Okay, now question number seven. In industry, copper metal is purified by electrolysis. Electrolysis is not in AS service anymore. So it's native completely. So I'm just gonna do this question quickly, basically. Now, which changes occur to the masses of the electrodes and to the color of the electrolyte during this process? Okay. <coughs> so basically, mass of cathode or the should increase, mass of anode should decrease, and the color of the electrolyte why would it change from pale blue to blue? I don't think it would, so it's just little normal. Color change occurs really, and the answer should be A. Now, again, you don't really need to worry about this too much because it's not even in AS anymore, but actually, I think it's IGCSE knowledge. <coughs> so, yeah, I mean. Sometimes these kind of questions are annoying. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it's more of, I guess, I just see the two. Not okay, yes, so don't worry. Anyways, question number eight. Nitrogen dioxide, NO2, is in equilibrium with dinitrogen tetroxide, which is a cool name. So cool. N2O4, okay? Now, which conditions give the greatest percentage of N2O4 gaseous at equilibrium? Two things to notice. One is that this side has two moles, this side has only one, one mole, right? And the forward reaction is exo. In one because it's minus 57 kilo per mole, negative. You know, I always call it minus, but then I realized the proper term is negative. I just can't get myself to say negative. That's just too many syllables, you know, compared to minus. <coughs> Anyways, um, which one should get the greatest percentage of into operate equilibrium? So pressure should be high, I'll tell you why. Because you see this side has two moles and this side has one mole. So if you increase the pressure, right? then that means your number of moles will increase. So what will equilibrium try to do? Equilibrium will shift the, you know, equilibrium um, to the right-hand side. So to, to the system will shift the equilibrium to the right-hand side so that because the side has one mole, so then the number of moles will decrease. If the number of moles decreases, then the pressure decreases. And hence, you can the equilibrium can be re-established, right? So that's why if you increase the pressure, you get more N2O4 because it's one mole. Now temperature, since the, for, the forward reaction is exothermic, <coughs> that means that if you lower the temperature, then you should get more of the forward reaction because if you lower the temperature, then there is <coughs> less heat in the system, right? So the equilibrium, like if, uh, like, you know, basically the right hand side of the equation will be favored because what will happen <coughs> is that since the forward reaction is exothermic, more of the exothermic reaction <coughs> will take place. And what happens in an exothermic reaction? Energy is uh, released, right? So if energy is released, that means you get more heat produced, which means your temperature will increase, and hence equilibrium can be re-established. So basically, you know, that's what the Chatelier's principle is, right? Like any change to the system, any, you know, change you make to the system, equilibrium will try to oppose that change and basically re-establish, uh, you know, the system will, to, system will try to oppose the change and re-establish equilibrium. So basically, the answer <coughs> is going to be, I love equilibrium, but also equilibrium is, you know, a bad thing when we talk about... Uh, you know, when you think of climate change as, I don't know, an entropy problem, and stuff. So in that case, you know, if the universe becomes a whole, universe becomes, you know, and, and even, you know, and e even temperature of, like, 59, I think, degrees Celsius, or was it Fahrenheit, I don't know, but basically it's a very, like, a 59, I think, Fahrenheit, yeah, probably Fahrenheit, so it'll be really, really cold, and stuff. I don't know, I mean, or, um, I don't know, but basically, <coughs> um, equilibrium is a scary thing. <coughs> I don't know, change, which I studied more about. When a sample of HI is warmed to a particular temperature, the equilibrium below is, just is established. At this temperature is found, the partial pressure of HI is 28 times the partial pressure of H2. So let's just assume the pressure of partial pressure of H2 is <coughs> x. So since H2 and I2 for one is to one more, <coughs> more ratio, this will be also x. <coughs> but then since H is on the different side of the equation, the left hand side. So if you're saying it's 28 times, it's going to be 28 times x, right? Then 28 x. Now what is the value of Kp? Kp is basically the partial pressure of the products divided by the partial pressure of the reactants, right? So it's going to be Kp equals to x, which is H2, times x, which is I2, and then uh, divided by 28 x. Then 28 x should be squared because the stoichiometric coefficient of HI is 2, right? So it's so going to be squared. So x squared divided by now what's the 28 squared that is 784 
x squared, okay, so x squared and x squared cancel each other out, and then 1 over 784 is 1.2755, 10 to the power of minus 3, which is approximately 1. Point, yeah, okay, I got the same answer as a, 1.28 into 10 to the power of minus 3, and since, and there are no units because on this side there are two moles, on that side there are two moles, so we can't be used as allowed, right, as you can see here. So then my answer is going to be a, okay, next <coughs> question. Question number 10. This is a nice paper. Photochromic glass used for sunglasses darkens when exposed to bright light and becomes transparent again when the light is less bright. Darkness of the glass is related to the concentration of silver atoms. The following reactions are involved. So Ag plus plus Cl minus is Ag plus Cl, Cu plus plus Cl gives you Cu2 plus plus Cl minus, Cu2 plus plus Ag gives you Cu plus plus Ag plus. Now which statement about these reactions is correct? Cu plus and Cu2 plus ions act as catalysts. Let us check. So if we you know, find out the overall equation, we'll cancel the terms that are the same, right? So on the left hand side and right hand side, the two terms that are the same, we're going to cancel them out. So Cl minus, Cl minus, if I can cancel that out as well. Cu2 plus Cu2 plus, that gets cancelled out. Cu plus, Cu plus, that gets cancelled out. And so, only thing I left, I have. What? 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 Everything else, everything got cancelled, bro. Hmm. It's not the right way to do it. Then. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I'm just stupid. But anyways, I guess let's just investigate the equation then, because that didn't work out too much in my favor. So if you look at it, Cu plus gets converted to Cu2 plus, and Cu2 plus gets reconverted to Cu plus. So it started out with Cu plus, and it ends at Cu plus again. So it remains unchanged uh, overall by the reaction, right? For the whole reaction mechanism. So if you're saying Cu plus and Cu2 plus I are exact as catalysts, I would say yes. But you know, I'm just going to check the other options as well, and all the other options, I think we're talking more about. Yeah, awesome. Uh, really lots of stuff. So Cu plus ions act as an oxidizing agent in reaction 2. So Cu plus ions. So this is plus 1, 2 plus 2. So if plus 1, 2 plus 2, that means its oxidation state is increasing, right? If it's increasing, that means um, becoming oxidized itself, which means it is a reducing agent. So Cu2 plus, Cu plus ions cannot be acting as an oxidizing agent. They must be acting as a reducing agent. So, yeah. Now, reaction 3 increases the darkness of the glass. Well, reaction 3, what is happening in reaction 3 is the Ag plus concentration is decreasing. The Ag Plus, so Ag concentration is decreasing, Ag plus concentration is decreasing. If I assume the darkness and silver atoms have a direct relationship, because I, I am just assuming that in the question, then I would say, um, you know, if the Ag decreasing is decreasing, then darkness is decreasing. So if they're saying that it increases the darkness, so it's actually decreasing the darkness, right? I, I think so. Uh, I'm assuming they have a direct relationship, and am I justified to assume that? Um, well, they're saying it darkens and exposed to bright light and becomes more transparent again when the light is less bright. I think, you know, this reaction is for, you know, the, you know, to get, a, a, you know, um, it's when your, you know, light is becoming brighter and so you're getting easy plus and blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I basically, I think I'm justified to assume this, but um, basically my point is it should, the reaction theory decreases the darkness of the class. But again, I don't know much about Photography and you know all this stuff. So yeah, but I'm just assuming here. Okay, now option A seems to be the most correct to me. Silver atoms are reduced in reaction <coughs> reaction three. So silver is zero here, plus one here. So that means its oxidation state is increasing. If its oxidation state is increasing, that means it's becoming oxidized, not reduced. This is wrong. So I'm gonna say the answer is A. Okay. I can check. Sorry about that. Again, I told you I'm sick. Ignore my weird sounds. The Boltzmann distribution below. The Boltzmann distribution below. Um, so it shows. <coughs> it shows the distribution of molecular energies in a sample of a gas at a given temperature. Which statement correctly describes the change in such a distribution if the temperature is increased? So in a Boltzmann distribution, actually, you know, um, the the man Maxwell Boltzmann. I think he was also known as the father of what was it statistical mechanics or something right so you know a c concepts in statistics are there are some concepts in statistics that are credited to him such as you know this type of graph shape you know 
that's also um, attributed to him. So he's really, you know, um, a big deal with statistics at that point. Uh, so this is more of a statistics type um, topic. Anyways, the point is that, um, you know, they label this as a number of molecules, but it's actually a number of molecules that <coughs> having a certain energy, right? Not, not a total number of molecules, but just like this energy, these number of molecules are this much energy. The number of molecules divided by energy is that point. And this is molecular energy, right? So and the area under the curve will be, you know, if you multiply the number of the x axis times the, the y axis times the x axis. So then the area under the curve basically becomes the total number of molecules, okay? So the total number of molecules, um, again, this is a more statistics and probability type, um, what do you call it, topic. But anyways, this is the area under the graph represents the total number of molecules. So the total number of molecules will not change, will it? So if it won't change, which means the area under the graph or curve stays the same. So now if you're um, increasing the temperature, the curve actually shifts to the right and the peak lowers a bit flatter. But the area under the, sorry, see my, my curves, you know, my, my drawing is just not very good. Um, but anyways, uh, I'm trying my best. Okay, ah, oh well, oh well. I know it's not a good, good curve, it's a lot of bumps, but you know, I hope you get the point. You know, this area is all shifted over here, so then it's still the same area under the curve in total, okay? And so, what's happening is the end of the curve will decrease, decrease. That's wrong. More molecules possess the most probable energy, but the most probable energy is the peak, and the peak is lowering, isn't it? Isn't it? So that means, because the most probable energy means the, the energy that the most particles have, and the most particles have the peak value, right? So that's decreasing. The peak is decreasing. So more molecules possess the most probable energy value. That's wrong. Fewer molecules possess the most probable energy value. That's right. Do you want an A to say that? And this value shifts to the right. As I showed you, it shifts to the right. Right? Because if you're increasing the temperature, the average energy of the particles is increasing, right? So the peak shifts to the right. The graph shifts to the right. But then fewer molecules possess this more probable energy value and this value shifts to the left. No, that will happen when the temperature decreases, okay? So the answer is going to be B. Yeah, this is a very cool graph. And I find Boseman to be a pretty cool <laughs> dude, at least. I don't know about his personal life, but, you know, the things he's done for, you know, physics, chemistry, math, everything. So, okay, what happened? I, my, my screen is a black screen. Okay, it's okay. Yeah, I'm back. Use of a data booklet is relevant to this question. Okay, I, I think we're nearing to the inorganic side now, although this is still, I guess, <laughs> a bit of a physical chemistry type question. So, anyways, an anhydrous nitrate of a group of metals. So I'm going to assume that the group of metal is just M, and um, since the nitrate, I'm just going to, you know, because nitrate is a Nitrate is going to be a ionic compound. So I'm going to say M2 plus NO3 minus will be the general formula of a group 2 nitrate that will be M NO3 twice. All right. So it's decomposed. So M NO3 twice gives you M should be MO unless you get <coughs> so you get the oxide of the metal metal oxide and plus what gas do you get? Well, you have NO3, so that should probably give you NO2 plus O2, right? Uh, usually. So that's the formula for decomposition of group 2 nitrates. To balance it out, I have NO3 twice, right? So there should be 2 NO2, and then uh, 2 to the... Uh, so I have 1 of MO, 3 to the 6, 6 oxygen on this side, 1 here, plus 4, and 5, so 1 plus 4, I um, five, 7, so I have 7 on this side, so then it's 1 by 2, two okay, so then it's balanced. Alright, so now you have 3 grams of this anhydrous nitrate, and you get 1.53 grams of gas. So, so the total gas I get is 1.53 grams. So what does that imply? How much of the metal oxide do I get? That must be 3.00 minus 1.53 which is what it is, you can have readers. or you can, you know, if you go to mental math, that's, that's great. I want to improve my mental math, actually. <laughs> yeah, and my, my brother is really good at mental math, I'm, I'm not that good. So anyways, you have 1.47 grams, right? So what is the nitrate compound? Okay, so we're supposed to identify what the nitrate compound is. So what can we do? Well, I can just assume that the, you know, the relative atomic mass of this M I'm just going to say it's M, okay? Just to make my life easier, okay? So M. So anyways, what I can do is that you can see that the ratio between M, MO3 twice, and MO is 1 is to 1, right? So 1 mole equals to 1 mole, I can say, okay? So what else? You know, I'll write it down in a different color, actually. 
So what I can say basically is one mole of M and O3 twice equals to one mole of because there's one is to one mole ratio, which means one mole is to one mole. So I'm just writing them down in a formal statement. If you get confused with this, you don't need to write it. But basically, then you know n equals to m over mr, right? So instead of this one mole, I can write m over mr. So over here it has <coughs> 3.00 divided <coughs> by now what's the mr of mno3 twice? Um, the mr of mno3 twice would be m plus ox nitrogen is 14, but then you have two of nitrogen, so that's 14 times 2 plus uh, you have 6 of oxygen, 3 times 2 is 6, so 16 times 6. Now if you find this out, so 14 times 2 is 28, 28 plus 16 times 6 would be 124. So the MR of this is 100, M plus 124, okay? And now if I find the MR of MO, that's going to be oxygen 16, right? So this is going to be 1.47 grams divided by M plus 16, okay? So this is the formula that I get, and what I just have to do now is rearrange the equation to get what the value of m is and that's the relevant type of mass okay so this is going to become i'm just going to cross multiply i don't really care for the significant very much okay so 3m plus now 16 times 3 is 48 equals to 1.47m plus now 1.47 times 124 is going to be 120 182 sorry 0.28 okay now uh, 3m minus 1.4 Four seven m equals to 182.8 28 minus 48. Again, you don't have to show all your working, but I'm just doing it so that you guys understand. Um, you know, again, like you even have a lot of time in P1, do you? What is the time of the paper? Uh, I don't, I don't even remember. How does it? Is it one hour fifteen minutes? I don't even remember from my yeah, one hour. Okay, wow. So yeah. Or right, I think now, now like in May June, like now like since 2022, I think it's one hour fifteen minutes, but I'm not sure. You, you check on the uh, or check in the syllabus, check in <laughs> the 2022 papers. I'm not really sure, but I think now it's one hour fifteen minutes, but it's confirmed. I'm going to five So yet M equals to eighty seven point seven six approximately uh grams per mole. So now if I look at my um periodic table which is somewhere down, yeah, here. So if I look at group two, nine, three, four, three, four, one, eight, seven, oh, look at that. Beautiful, 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 okay. So, very, 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 so I got 87.6 and that is, that's what I got. That's literally, well, approximately what I got, right? Um, and um, that is strontium. So basically, what is the nitrate compound? Using my method, I got strontium nitrate. The other way you could do it is you could, substitute you know um you could find what the what moles you get for example they're saying barium nitrate so what moles you get for barium nitrate but you for barium oxide so they're the same and do it for each of these and then you'll end up with but i think this is a way of doing it you know in you know less tests because there you have to consider every option here you're finding which option you consider so that's here. now what happens next question what happens when a piece of magnesium ribbon is placed in cold water. Ah, you know, I like chemistry, but then the you know, ones where you have to know the reactions, I found them very annoying. But obviously, a good chemist should, you know, have some experience with, you know, experimental side work too. You know, I like experiments and stuff, but I don't remember like remembering stuff. So, anyways, magnesium in cold water. So that's Mg plus H2O cold, not steam. So, in, if it's steam, you get MgO, right? But it's not steam. So, you just get MgOH twice hydroxide plus hydrogen gas and now if you balance it out so you have two plus two four the hydrogen so that it's two and it's balanced now what happens <clears throat> that's in your options a vigorous effervescence <coughs> occurs no it doesn't because I'm going to show you like it's a slow reaction you get MgOH twice instead of MgO right so it's not a very vigorous reaction um, and bubbles of gas form slowly in the magnesium that is right slow reaction also hydrogen gas right Magnesium just flows in the surface of water and reacts quickly. It doesn't really react that quickly. If you write down the group, two things, right? Like, so the magnesium is really not that reactive compared to, like, barium, for example, right? When the magnesium glows and a white solid is produced. Not to mention that MgOH2 is, you know, actually like a less soluble hydro hydroxide compared to 
frame because the height the sod <coughs> the height of the sides increases on the group. Right? As you remember. So yeah. Um yeah, it's not a very um fast or vigorous reaction. The magnesium glows and a white solid is produced. Uh, this is well, I mean it is a bit of a yeah, it's solid. I mean I think magnesium hydroxide is insoluble. Yeah, probably. <coughs> white solid is produced. But why would random start glowing is my question. I didn't introduce any flame or anything. So I'm gonna say the answer is B. Bubbles of gas form slowly in the magnesium because that represents the slow nature of the reaction, okay? Um next question. Compound X releases carbon dioxide gas and forms a white solid. Why? Um when it is heated. Neither X nor Y are solid in water. Okay. Compound X. Sorry. Compound Y is used as a refractory line kiln line. So what is compound X? So if I have CaCO3, then the, you know if you're looking at if you discover a certain form of white solid, why when it is heated, so you know it becomes CaO plus CO2. CaO plus CO2. CaO Neither X nor Y are soluble in water. CaCO3, I think calcium carbonate is soluble in water because that would be, I don't know what's it called, lime water and stuff like that. COH twice. So that means if you're saying neither X nor Y are soluble in water, that's, it can't be CaCO3 then. CaO, well, I mean, how would you get CO2 from CaO? I, I really don't get it because you're just heating it, you're not introducing any carbon element it's just oxygen heating, or basically it's just decomposition more so so that would be wrong as well and again similarly the same goes for CaO plus to MgO as well like what if anything you know CaO MgO those, those would be more likely to be Y instead of X right and then if you look at MgCO3 that seems to be the answer to me <coughs> because <coughs> um Am I actually no CaCO3 gives you CaO plus CO2. MgCO3 gives you MgO plus CO2, right? So CaCO3, MgCO3, I think, I mean, you know, again, inorganic is, yeah, I don't remember all the details, always in inorganic, but as I remember, carbonates, group 2 carbonates at the very least. Group two carbonates are insoluble in water. Insoluble in water, right? So yeah, oh, I think so because Mg two plus CO three two minus is a very strong charge. How you know it's hard for it to decompose Ca two plus CO three two minus yeah, insoluble in water, but then you know it is all a bit. So let me just check this though. Our group two. Carbonates. No, I don't want. Is there water? Okay. Yeah, they are though. More soluble than the carbonates in there. Sorry, this that's the wrong hydrocyte. Yes, they are insoluble in water. And they're soluble in acidic solution, which is why we add acid to test if you know, thing is a carbonate because of the release. Yeah, so these are insoluble, but then if you compare CaO and MgO, well, um, I should not write that down. I should think about the solubility of, um, yeah, because <clears throat> neither X nor Y so water compound Y is used as a refractory kill lining. MgO is definitely used as a refractory kill lining because Mg2 plus O2 minus is a very high charge density compound. So it should be MgCO3, I think, in that case. If you think that Mg is here, it has a high ch charge density compared to Ca, which is lower down. So uh, you know, because CaO, I don't, I'm pretty sure that's all used as a refractory kiln lining. But MgO, I remember studying that it's used as a refractory kiln lining. So I would say that MgCO3 would be your answer. But MgCO3 is X, Mg is Y. Okay, and neither X nor Y soluble in water. Yes, Mg2 plus uh, O2 minus MgO that is very strong, so it's not soluble in water. CaO, I guess. It's might be funny because how else would you get CaOH twice, right? Or should I say more than slightly? Anyways, you would check things like solubilities yourself, but I'm going to say the answer is C. Next question. Use the data booklet is relevant to this question. 
which diagram correctly shows the electronegativity of the elements sodium, magnesium, aluminium, and silicon plotted against their first ionization emissions. Okay, so sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon. Huh. Okay, so the electronegativity actually increases across a period, right? So sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon should be increasing. Sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon again, they're actually going to be increasing when you open up this axis, right? It's confusing. This is a very really random order, so I'm going to really do this. This is, you know, what is this order? I told you it increases across a period. And over here again, this is, again, the wrong order for the electronegativity, so I'm going to cross those two out. And then, what do I want to do? The first ionization of energy. So, if they said I can use it in a booklet, let me use it in a booklet, why not? So, I mean, now you don't get the data booklet, you know. This is the time you could choose the data booklet, so I'm going to use that to my advantage. Yes, okay. So, the first ionization energy of sodium is plus 2080. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. That was neon, so sodium plus 494. That makes more sense. Plus 494. Magnesium is 636. And aluminium is plus 577. And silicon is plus 786. So actually, I think it should be B then, because you know, those match. We're going to get A plus 494. Plus 786, plus 577, 786, and you can get it left to right. That's wrong. So it cannot be A because these values should be green, obviously. 494, 577, 786, 786. So looking at the data, my answer seems to be to be. Okay. So yeah, that is my answer. <sighs> you know, like generally across a period. Now your <coughs> shielding is nearly constant. Shielding effect is nearly constant because it's the same number of shells and your atomic radius also is nearly constant except it only to be slightly. So um you know but the number of protons increases, right? Because of period. So nuclear charge increases, which means there's stronger nuclear force of attraction. So your if there's a stronger nuclear force of attraction, the valence electrons are pulled more strongly, right? As you go across the period, that means your ion emission energy increases. But then, magnesium, aluminium, um, um, you know, the trend is a bit different because between magnesium and aluminium, um, what happens between group 2 and 3, there's addition of p subtle right? Like, when you get magnesium, what's the electron, what's, what's the number of electrons of magnesium? It's 12. That's going to be 1 is 2, 2 is 2, 2 p. 3 is 2, right? I mean, aluminium is one more than that. So 1 is 2, 2 is 2, 2 plus 6, 3 is 2, 3 plus 1. So it has the addition of P subshell, right? Aluminium. So since the P subshell gets added, the slight increase in the atomic radius and in the number of shielding electrons, more importantly, I guess. And that reduces the nuclear force of attraction of the valence electrons of aluminium slightly, which means that since the nuclear force of attraction of the valence electrons increase, it's easy for aluminium to lose them compared to magnesium. So aluminium has a you know, lower first ionization energy because it requires less energy to be ionized the first time compared to magnesium. So the trend changes between aluminium and magnesium, right? And then what was the rest of the negativity? See, I want to state the reason for the negativity because I want to state the reason for the negativity. Okay, I'm going to go back to that. Hmm, what have I written? Past, okay, about, I don't know which, but I know, grade 11. So, extra period. It's the same reason, pretty much, isn't it? Yeah. The more the number of shells of an atom, the greater the atomic radius. But then, I'm sorry, the electronegativity increases across the period because you have the same number of shells, and so the shielding is the same, and blah blah blah. So nothing of that changes. But then the photon number increases, right? So the nuclear force of attraction on the, you know, what do you call it? Well, in electronegativity, you're talking about bonds so shared electron pair then you put the electron shared electron pair by the atom increases so there's greater electronegativity means the greater electronegativity difference right 
course, like an introduction and everything, in case it's a course video. Oh yeah, I, I just ramble on too much, I know, but anyways, I hope you got <laughs> the concept of the question. Next question, again, AS doesn't have electrolysis anymore, but still, I, I guess I'll do this question. But again, not too much in detail. Diagram shows a diaphragm cell used for the electrolysis of brine. <coughs> brine is concentrated aqueous sodium chloride. A solution of sodium chlorate 1, which is NaClO3, which have, you know, you get plus 1 plus x, I'm going to do chlorine with x, and oxygen is minus 2, right? So minus 2 times 3 more. Carrying the oxygen, oxygen state of chlorine is equal to 0 because the whole oxygen is equal to 0. Plus 1 minus x is going to be minus 5, minus 5 plus x equals 0. So x equals to plus 5, alright? So, oh wait, am I wrong then? Plus 5, so then Corey, N-A-C-L-O, minus 2, plus 1, plus x, equals 0. Oh, yes, I think I'm wrong. Oh my god, why did I just randomly go in random of this zero to and that turned out to be sodium chloride? Why? That's so embarrassing. But anyways, it's going to be NACLO then, I guess. Plus 1 plus x minus 2 equals 0. x minus 1 equals 0. I, I was so confident, I swear. x equals plus 1. Now, a solution of sodium chloride 1, commonly used as bleach, can be made by mixing which two substances? So, P and R... First, uh, so let's, well, what 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 is happening here? So you have brine, <coughs> which is concentrated aqueous vapor. You have Na plus Cl minus H plus OH minus. Concentrated aqueous sodium chloride means you know chloride will be formed in preference, but then if you do sodium, which is H plus it's H plus because sodium is more reactive and stuff. So you will see we get NaOH in the solution then. So, if we're talking about gas at the anode, at the anode you get Cl minus, so sorry, Cl2, uh, and then at the cathode, what gas do you get? You get the H2 gas, right? And then the solution you have NaOH. This should be exit pipe, I guess. <coughs> so, what substances get sodium chlorate? How many substances can make them just which two substances? So, P is what? P is, uh, I'm just gonna write it down somewhere. Okay, so, P is Cl2. Q is H2, and then R is going to be what? What is R? Is R just NaCl, I guess? S is NaOH. I, I'm assuming, okay, I'm assuming these, but maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. So anyways, now what can I make sodium chlorate 1 using? P and R, which is Cl2 and NaCl, that's just really random. Probably not. Not NaCl. I wouldn't randomly use NaCl. Q and R. No. It's definitely going to be, I think, NaOH. As I remember, like, it's NaOH and Cl2. So that's P and S. <coughs> See, um, you know, I, I again, I, I find it hard to remember the inorganic reaction, but you know what? I should revise them. Let me find the proper reaction for you guys. You can keep it in mind, remember it, and what is it, and stuff. Find the reaction. I wrote it down somewhere. Once upon a time, in grade eleven. Remember? But no, my notes are messed up. It's hard to find stuff. Okay. Right. Did I, did I find it? Yes, I did. So we are talking about. This is the reaction Cl2 plus NaOH, but then it's uh, 2 NaOH gives you NaCl plus NaClO, which is sodium chloride 1 plus H2. Okay, so this is the reaction, and you can, you can be able, I, I balanced it, I already have the balance form written, but you can balance it using redox as well. And yeah, sodium chloride 1 commonly uses bleach, it bleaches many, you know, it bleaches things by oxidizing many other substances, actually, I think. So anyways, yeah, the answer is B, okay? So this is NaOH and CO2. Now, which statement about the ammonium ion, NH4+, is correct? 
Mm, let's see what it is. Are politically correct or incorrect? Not politically, but chemically. So all bond angles are 170 degrees. But draw it out, oh, which I already did once before in this paper, actually. Um, this, this is the structure. And it's for plot. Wait, wait. Draw it a bit better, a bit, a little bit better. And uh, hmm. let's see. Okay. So first, let's find out the steric number. Steric number is the number of lone pairs plus the number of sigma bonds. Pi bonds are not counted in hybridization stuff. But you know, let's look. It's one, two, three, four, four lone, four um, sigma bonds, and no lone pairs right? because it's donated this bond to the edge. So it's the steric number is four, four, and there are no pi bonds. So the steric number is four times the hybridization. It will be S P three, right? So 1s plus 3p, so you get sp3, okay? Because uh, that gives you 4 in total. <coughs> Start number, okay? So sp3. So sp3 hybridization means what is the bond angle? It's 109.5 degrees. And since there's no lone pair, it remains 109.5 degrees. For NH3, NH3 has a lone pair actually, right? So it would actually, oh my god, what am I, why am I drawing this so bad? So bad. I know my drawing is bad, but I don't know how I stuck this for myself. Okay? So you get the strike number is four because one, two, three, four. It has one, one lone pair and three sigma bonds. But then the difference is that the bond angle will be one hundred nine point five minus two point five because each lone pair reduces the bond angle by one, and you have a lone. Pair, okay. So all bond angles are one hundred seven degrees, not in NH four plus. They are wrong and try to confuse. Ammonia ions are formed when ammonia behaves as an acid. Ammonia behaves as an acid means it donates H plus, but ammonia doesn't donate H plus. Ammonia accepts H plus to form ammonium ion, right? So that means that not in an acid, but as in base. Okay, ammonia is a very you know, we should know that ammonia is a base, not an acid, uh, from your chemistry factual knowledge. Um, ammonium ions are unreactive when we act when heated with NaOH aqueous. No, because if ammonia behaves in, as a base, that means that ammonium ions behave in, as an acid, right? That's your conjugate acid base theory. So ammonia ions are unreactive when heated with a base, and the OH aqueous doesn't seem likely because acid-base reaction will occur. Am I right? So I would say that the answer is C. The bonds are all the same length. <coughs> okay, wait. Now I'm confused. Is it C or D? What? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I, I, I don't know why. I mean, I just right now I said that there will be a reaction, right? And they're saying it's unreactive. So that means obviously this is wrong because ammonium ions are reactive and heated in any way, which means the statement is wrong. And I accidentally read it. I accidentally think I read it as reactive. That's why. Right. Anyways, the point is that yes, the bonds are all the same length because you know sp3 hybridization, hybridization, and there are no pi bonds or anything like that. So that means you know all of these will be, become hybridized um, orbitals, and then you know all the bond lengths will be the same basically. So the bonds are all the same lengths, okay? So <coughs> because hybridization, hybrid, hybridization will take place. So the answer is going to be D. Cool. I actually remember this question from one of you know I, we had a chemistry test once or something. I remember my teacher put this question in it. So yeah, not like I have an emotional attachment to this question, but I think I got very passionate to this question. <laughs> If we call it. Anyways, carbon monoxide CO. I still got it wrong in the beginning. <laughs> I can see, right? Because I'm going to manage your reactive. Anyways, let's go to the next question. Carbon monoxide CO, nitrogen dioxide, NO2, and sulfur dioxide, SO2, <coughs> are all atmospheric pollutants. Which reaction concerning these compounds occurs in the atmosphere? Okay, in the atmosphere. CO is spontaneously oxidized to CO2. Uh, NO2 is reduced by 2NO by CO. NO2 is reduced by NO NO2 is reduced by NO2 SO2 SO2 is oxidized to SO3 by CO2. Hmm, okay. So CO is spontaneously oxidized to CO2. Spontaneously oxidized. I have a feeling that's wrong because otherwise I would just be so concerned about carbon monoxide poisoning and all that stuff, right? NO2 is reduced <coughs> by an NO2 is reduced to NO by CO. That occurs in a catalytic converter. I don't think it occurs naturally. NO2 is reduced by N2 NO by SO2. Hmm. Hmm. NO2 is reduced to NO by SO2. Isn't that like 
a part of the reaction performing acid rain and then NO2 plus SO2 gives you NO plus SO3 and you know, this further becomes H2SO4 and stuff or was it HNO3 uh, but anyway the point uh, <coughs> it's a full problem yeah yeah of course what is SO3 I don't know why I'm being so stupid right now. But since acid rain is a concern for us and like I feel like this reaction is for the acid rain stuff, I'm gonna say this because probably that occurs. Yeah, you're right. SO2 is oxidized to SO3 by CO2. Really? Is it? SO2 plus CO2 gives you SO3 plus CO. Seems like a very weird reaction. Well, not weird, but you know. I'm not sure that occurs naturally at the point. Like sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide reaction together naturally. I don't know, man. But and, and the atmosphere means. So I'm gonna say my answer is C because that seems to be like you know the acid rain type answer and acid rain probably occurs in, in the atmosphere. That's why we're too concerned about it. Am I right? So the answer is gonna be C. Okay. So yeah, but you should probably you know I just did like that, but you should probably check your inorganic notes and you know, see if I'm right and stuff. So. Yeah, just check out the notes and try to memorize small little facts like this that they show these are in the atmosphere, area. Yeah. So next question. This is again one of the uh, chlorate type things. Chlorate five ions, ClO three minus. Okay, so last time I said ClO minus and this is ClO three minus, okay. Uh, so I produced in a redox reaction between chlorine and hot aqueous sodium hydrosides. The reaction for that would be NaOH plus ClO two. Gives you N, if I remember right, um, so I'm going to forget my book, I'm going to try to make memory, so hopefully it's right, plus H2O, and now if I balance it out, which is what they're asking me to do, actually, so, <laughs> remember, <laughs> I balance the equation, so I'm going to balance it on myself, another way to do it is look at the equation, with the options, see whether you get the same number of, you know, moles on both sides for, you know, each atom and see whether the of the options is right that's one way you could do it or you can do it the way i'm gonna do it so the video so na plus is gonna be just plus one and then this one is minus two here actually minus two remains minus two everywhere oh what, what did i do what did i do yeah so um one of the changes the co2 changes co2 is zero here and over here clo3 minus is chlorate five and so i'm assuming it's plus five because also confirm and check it and i did confirm it before in the previous question by mistake so I'm not going to waste my time checking it again. And then over here, Cl is minus 1. Okay, so this is a disproportionation reaction with the same substance as oxidized and reduced simultaneously, right? So that's called a disproportionation reaction, okay? So now I'm going to draw two arrows, two, two, two arrows. Yes, two beautiful, beautiful arrows. Uh, you know, I think I'm starting to go a bit crazy because it's like, you know, in my country here, it's 12.52, they don't do anything. Anyway. So 12.52, that means it's correct. AM. So, you know, I don't know why I'm away again rather than doing chemistry, but, you know, sometimes I'm just crazy, okay? So, over here, following the lower arrow, 0 to minus 1, that means it's uh, reduced, um, and its oxidation state is decreasing by 1, which means it uh, reduction is gained, right? So, it's gain, it gains 1 electron, okay? Gains 1 electron, and then above the arrow, the, it's going from 0 to plus 5, so that means its oxidation state is becoming, you know, increasing by 5, which means it loses... Five electrons with oxygen is lost, right? Now, if I find the LCM between five and one, that's obviously going to be um, what do you call it? Five. So, so this is going to be times one, and this is going to be times five. So, um, in total, I would say I have what, 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 what do I have? Oh, what do I have three CO2 because three times two is six, so then I have six the CO's everywhere, right? And then if this is one. I want to make this 5, 5 NaCl, so I have 6 of Na, so I'm going to make this 6 NaOH. Now, if I'd rather say H2O, so 6 H's, so that means this has to become 3 H2, okay? So that's what I got the balanced equation as. Hopefully, I'm right, otherwise, too bad, too sad. So, um, now, which are the coefficients I have to look at? Okay, so V is the CO2 one, which I got as 3, so I'm going to say it's either B or C. Then, X is the Cl minus one, which you get from NaCl, and I got that as five. So probably the answer is C. And now if I need to confirm, I have to check Y as well, which is Cl three minus, which is from here, and I got that as one. So that means my answer is most probably C. Okay, so that's what I got. 
Well, we have finally um Uh, organic, sorry, I don't know if I forgot the name. Let's do organic now. Yay. I recently been doing a lot of A2 organic, and A2 organic is pretty fun actually because we have a lot of benzene chemistry, which is so pretty. I'm, I'm still not good at drawing <coughs> hexagons though. <coughs> what happened to my voice? I don't know. I think I should drink some water. I'll, I'll come back uh, after a bit, drink some water with the bottle, and record the organic part, okay? Alright, I'm back, so let's do organic chemistry now. Which alcohol will react with an acidified solution of potassium dichromate 6 to produce a ketone containing 6 carbon atoms? Atoms, okay, so um, potassium dichromate 6. So if you have an alcohol and you have potassium dichromate 6, <coughs> potassium dichromate 6 oxidizes primary alcohols and secondary alcohols. So primary alcohols become COOH and then secondary alcohols become ketones, right? But then the tertiary alcohols, at first, you know, primary alcohol first becomes CHO and then COOH depends on whether you keep on heating it or whether you just gently warm it or whether you heat it. In reflux and stuff, then tertiary alcohols they can't really be oxidized, right? Because <coughs> if you have this, then you place to add more oxygen, anyways. So, a ketone containing six carbon atoms, you want a ketone containing six carbon atoms. So, first, you have to have a secondary alcohol somewhere. So, let's just draw these out. I'm gonna draw the skeletal formulas because I find them more comfortable, but you know, you can draw the structure or whatever. If you want, so two two dimethyl butane one also butane and one also I'll make an OH here, two two dimethyl. So on the second one I'll make a one two two uh, branches. And now if I oxidize this, what will I get? So I'm just going to write below actually. So I will get first I have the butane one OH and then I have the meth. That's right now here, I have the methyls here. And then just to erase some stuff. Sorry about that. And then, um, what about the OH? So the OH becomes COOH, right? So I hope that's clear. I don't know if I, maybe I should draw it a bit. I'll draw it a bit tilted so that you can see it better. Okay. So O, and then, okay. You know what? I'll just draw it again because I don't really have space to draw it properly. Okay. So I'll just draw it again. Okay. That, fine, finally. Okay. So it becomes COOH and that is not a ketone, right? So, uh, obviously, one also. I shouldn't even be tempted at now. If I look at option B, that is 2 methyl pentane 3 also. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's 5 carbon atoms. Pentane 3 also. OH is here. And then 2 methyl. So, the methyl is here. You can start from the left or right. doesn't matter. Anyways, um, I'm say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, now, if we oxidize this, well, this will become this way. And this. Now, obviously, it has six carbon atoms because five, five in the main carbon chain and one on the methyl, right? And then you have a ketone. To produce a ketone containing six carbon atoms. So, B should be the answer. Let's check the other options too, though. So, C, 3, 3 dimethyl pentane 2 ohms, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and pentane 2 ohms, and then 3, 3 dimethyl. See, that's the problem, right? Pentane 2 ohms. So, pentane has five, and then dimethyl means one plus one, so that's two. And so, one plus one plus five is seven. So, you immediately can tell that's wrong, right? And yeah, even no, that was actually six. So we should have checked that one. And three methyl pentane three oh, that is six. So we can we don't even need to do this one actually. This C one, but I'm gonna do it because I don't know. It's just fun to draw skeletal formulas. Okay, if I have an excuse to draw skeletal formulas, why not formulae? Maybe I should say formulae. But anyways, um, OH and then three methyl. So this is a tertiary alcohol, so it's not even going to be oxidized, right? So yeah. So yeah, the answer has to be. Next question. <laughs> this is a ketone, and this is the six carbon thing. What is the major product formed when compound Q is warmed with excess of HBr? Interesting. So we have this one, and then excess HBr. Okay, so I think it will be like a you know, addition, uh, electrophilic addition reaction. So you get HBr added here. But then which one would be the 
major product right so if I draw it again so I'm gonna attempt to draw the intermediates so one intermediate could be like this right I was gonna more so if I do this one <coughs> See, I, I don't remember the electric mechanism. Remember, it's part of the e, one of the easiest things in the organic chemistry, right? But I don't remember it properly from here. The one could be like this, one intermediate, and then you have um, one H, zero H attaches here basically from HBr, and then the other could be that you have it like this, and then you have OH, and then you have this thing OH, and then this is your one that has that positive charge and your H attached here, right? From HBr. So then the Br will attack the Br minus nucleophile. Well, we will attack here. Hmm. The Br minus am I am I doing this right or am I doing the opposite? HBr HBr. Yes, it will plus Br minus, right? <coughs> the H attaches and the Br attaches there. <coughs> Yeah, I'm doing it right. Here. <laughs> so now, um, you know, if you look at it, it's like this, this one has one alcohol group, and then this one, I don't know if I should consider the benz the hexagon, sorry, came as also alcohol groups. But anyways, I mean to say, even if those directed electrons toward it, even if I'm not sure whether they do, but Anyways, this one has this alkyl group, right? That means this would be the more stable one, the stabler one, anyways. So, if it's a stabler one, then that means my major product will probably be from this one. Um, by the way, I guess you could easily know it from my phonic rule, right? Uh, which, I, I don't exactly remember word to word what my phonic rule was. I'll check that and then tell you guys. But this is going to be a major product, which is, hmm. so... I would think that's it, but then one more thing actually, if it's HBr, will my OH react with it? That's a question, which I am thinking about now. Will my OH react with HBr? It's an excess, actually, so should it react with my HBr? I, I, should I just assume that it reacts with HBr? Okay, so they're saying in the inter on the internet that alcohols react with the strongly acidic hydrogen halides HCl, HBr, and HI, but they do not react with non acidic NaCl, NADR, and F. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So, I mean, I guess we can assume for this that the alcohols do react with, um, you know, the uh, HBr. So, hmm. Then what will happen is. Then the and I use excess HBr as well, I guess. Mm. Excess is why I mentioned that. Yes. So then this becomes Br. This this gets substituted, right? So it becomes Br and Br. So I would say which one matches <coughs> with the product? This one, right? So my answer is going to be C then. And um, see, I don't remember. Like, um, I'll I'll find out what the exact wording of the Michonic of school was. It was. I remember how to apply it, but I don't remember the wording of it. Even though you don't need to know the exact rule for, um, you know, um, A level, CIE chemistry, but still. Okay, so Markovnikov's rule. In addition of HX or H2O to an alkene, the hydrogen is added to that unsaturated carbon that already has more H atoms to give to the major product. Yeah, I guess that's a way of stating it. So this one has more H atoms, right? So this one has one, you know, the occupied space has and, um, you know, side chain we have. So then this one, if the Marconicos rule, this one will have the H added to it and this one will have Br added to it. So that was me, Marconicos rule. But basically, yeah. <coughs> That's what happens then. <coughs> Things, the logic is there, right? Um, you know, it will be added to the one that has more other groups and stuff, I think. So, yeah. 
anyways um the answer is B so yeah apparently alcohol does react with h3r so that's pretty interesting alcohol react with the strongly acidic hydrogen halides so they're not very non acidic and it's real and the brn okay pretty cool hydro so just has a cool name hydrohalic acids so yeah it reacts with hbr so um hmm. but yeah okay fine so that is the answer let's go to the next question now instead of wasting time i know i sometimes waste a lot of time four students w x y and z what type of names are those bro <laughs> okay anyways made the following statements about alkanes and alkenes bromine reacts with alkanes by electro substitution well alkanes their uh, main reaction mechanism is actually free radical substitution so i would say w is wrong bro you know each um, organic you know um you know group or they have their own set of you know um reactions you know that they're more um, prone to have bromine reacts with alkenes by a free radical addition mechanism now, alkenes, their um, usual reaction is electrophilic addition, right? So, I would say that X is also wrong. I, I wish they had normal names rather than W, S, Y, and Z, honestly. Alkenes can be oxidized by acidified manganese 7 ions. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you have an alkene and then you do hot, acidified, concentrated MnO4 minus or KMnO4, then this will get, you know, the, the oxidative, oxidative cleavage will take place. So, then you that it places the double bond because it's a primary one, so you get OH, and then in the other place as well, you will get COOH. I mean, that's just one example, but if you had, for example, cold dilute, um, you know, for minus uh, H plus, then that, you know, then you would get um, a diode. And if you had a, it would be different if you had a secondary, uh, okay, I, mean, I mean, to say if you had one like group there then that'll be different as well like you would get a from from that you would get a ketone here and over on this side you would get a COOH again I don't know why I'm going on in rants but basically my point is that why the student number or student letter Y is right why did I say number Num why is not a number anyways so Y is right and then alkenes are formed from alkanes by cracking that is right Cracking. If I have an alkane, I don't know what what's the original formula of alkanes. CNH two n plus two, isn't it? Hold on, I watched a uh, Instagram reel about this. F a funny one. Anyways, C two H two plus four six. So C two H six gives you C two H four, which is an alkane, right? Ethene. So C ethene gives you ethene plus H two. Right, so that's for example, I'll give an example of fracking. So Y and Z are right. So my answer will be D. Okay. Or the alternative is you look at the options, but you know if you can eliminate yourself, that's great. Okay. Next question. Butane dioxic acids, so let me just draw it out. Actually, no, don't worry. Draw it for me there. So I'll just wait. Maybe synthesized in two steps. Two steps, they want two steps from one to diabromoethane. Okay. So which reagents could be used for the synthesis? Uh, now this is a test whether I remember my reagents or not. I don't know. Probably I, I don't know if I do. I'm gonna draw skeletal formulas again because I just like skeletal formulas. Okay, and they're just so useful. And whoever invented them, I'm really grateful to them because they they're so convenient. Okay, which reagents could be used for the synthesis? So basically, in butane dioic acid, I have butane, which means I have four. But in one two dibromoethan, I only have two carbon atoms, right? So that means I've added two carbon atoms. So I definitely need to have HCN because HCN is the one you usually think about when you're adding carbons, right? So out of these all, I just have HCN here. I also have KCN, so I might consider it. I'll, I'll look at either of these, okay? And um, I'm, it's either going to be HCN or KCN. I think it's KCN. Now that I think about it, because HCN usually has nucleophilic addition, right? But KCN is nucleophilic substitution. So if you substitute the BR. So my, maybe, I was, maybe I was wrong about that. Let me just try to figure out a reaction mechanism. Okay, CN, CN. Okay, if I get that, that means for that I would have used KCN alcoholic because HCN again is nucleophilic addition. So, but KCN is nucleophilic substitution. So these these get substituted basically, right? By CN, KCN in ethanol. So I would say maybe it's probability, but now my next step 
if I hydrolyze this um, COO, uh, well, I mean, if I do base hydrolysis, I would get salt, but if I do acid hydrolysis, I get COOH. So I would need to do acid hydrolysis, so I need dilute um, acid, some dilute acid like HCl or H2SO4, and I think in option C, they'll give you H2SO4 aqueous, which means that, yes, this does seem to be a likely pathway. And then next step, what are they doing? But then this is a problem. Oh, no, it's not a problem, actually. <laughs> no, there are only two steps. I thought there was one more additional step, but no, they're, they're asking for two steps only. That's right. So um, this, to me, seems to be the correct answer. Most reasonable answer, which I, is the easiest to get as well. I don't know about the other ones. I didn't try them out. But to me, it seems that C is the correct answer. So KCN and ethanol or any alcohol, I don't know. And we have a dilute acid for acid hydrolysis. Because if you did basic hydrolysis, you would get a salt. That's why. So you need, you need COOH, right? That's why. So now, it's just so fun to draw scary formulas. So fun, really. Now, which reaction would not give propene? Okay. So propene is what? Propene is a three uh, carbon alkene, right? So I'm going to draw a line like that to represent the alkene number one. Alkene, okay? So now I'll look at A. So adding, uh, sorry, why am I circling it? I, I don't know, no, wait. So, okay, what am I even doing? Now, uh, oh my god, I'm doing very well. Okay, so first we have A. So A is adding excess hot concentrated sulfuric acid to propane 1O. So let me draw propane 1O. And you're adding excess hot concentrated sulfuric acid to propane 1O. So it means you're doing dehydration of the alcohol, right? So basically, you lose this OH and you lose NH from the adjacent carbon atom. So I will get. Um, So if I have a hot concentrated H2O4, SO4, and I have uh, an alcohol, I will basically get an alkene. So, or you know, I don't know if it's right to draw it like this or like this. I, I don't know. I mean, let me see on internet how they usually draw propene skeletal formula because, hmm, I don't want to. Images. So, okay, they've, they've shown it inside, right? Like the, the line is inside. So I guess I'll do that too. So... Like I did before in the first one. And I don't know if you need to join the lines or not, but you know, you're, I, I don't think it really matters that much. I don't know. I'm not that. Sometimes I am pedantic. Sometimes I'm not. My brother taught me this word. I'm pedantic. Anyways, <laughs> so that is how you draw it. So that gives you propene. So this is right. And then we need one that has cross because if not. Now adding warm aqueous sodium hydroxide to 2 bromopropane. If I have propane, and then this is 2 bromopropane. And if I'm adding excess warm um, sodium, uh, aqueous sodium, I uh, sorry, not excess, a uh, warm excess sodium hydroxide, what does that mean? I'm just doing nucleophilic substitution, right? So um, nucleophilic substitution, and um, I am adding NaOH aqueous, not ethanolic, if it was ethanolic, then it would be an elimination reaction to form an alkene. So now I, oh yes, that means this is the answer, isn't it? Because it's, I said uh, that if it is ethanolic, then it would be. A reaction to form alkene but this is substitution so you get oh right so this is also sorry this does not give you propane so this is probably the answer but let's check the other two as well okay so numbers uh, letter c i don't know why i keep saying number like who says that c is a number i don't know oh well sometimes mistakes happen anyways so you have one bromopropane okay so they have one bromopropane doesn't matter if it's one bromo or two bromo you will get you know an alkene if you have ethanolic sodium hydroxide this is the reaction i was talking about before so naoh in ethanol and so what do you get you get um an alkene and you also get hbr <coughs> as your byproduct <laughs> i couldn't mention byproducts because they're like this what do you get here nabr is it mm, i think so and over here obviously you get h2o because you're eliminating water or dehydration, right? So this is basically an elimination reaction, and it gives you an alkene as well. If I'm writing any byproduct or anything wrong, you guys are free to write it in the comments, because of course I can make mistakes. I'm not really, you know, a professional uh, chemist or anything, honestly. Just a random AP student <laughs> who likes chemistry a lot, though. Yeah. So passing propane to all overheated aluminum oxide. Now, again, this is also... Uh, a dehydration reaction of alcohols like you can either use you know something like silicon dioxide or you can use hot concentrated sulfuric acid or you can use heated aluminum oxide i'm not sure if you need to heat silicon dioxide i don't know if i've written that in my notes or not see i'm glad i wrote notes for as honestly because it's very quite useful to look back and refer to you know 
So yeah, but they're very messy. So no one understands them except me because my handwriting goes all over the place and yeah, it's quite messy to understand my handwriting. So I have to improve my handwriting, I guess. Anyways, um, yeah, so you can use concentrated <coughs> H2SO4 or solid, uh, you know, 3 hot uh, or, or SiO2 solid, also hot. So, um, uh, hot, by hot, I mean heated, not like cool. <laughs> okay, and you just pass it on cool. What, how, what's the relation? Yeah. I'm sorry, I just, I'm pressing random things, forgive me. Anyways, um, over, because this is Al203, um, solid, um, and heated, right? I should say heated, Al203, sorry, whatever. I'm writing it below the arrow because something above, something below looks nice. Anyways, so this gives me also the alpropene, right? Or you could, you know, it's, it's fine, really, if you, why did I do that again? Yeah, it should be inside. It's fine if you do it on this side or that side, it's the same thing, right? So like this or like this same thing so anyways um basically my answer here is going to be b because that's the one that does not give me propane b gives me um you know what's what's this propane tool right but i need propane so 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 that's the answer okay next question question number 25 <sighs> My question is, who comes up with these names? I mean, are these really official Ayurvedic names? Or are they just cool-sounding names that I like? Even, I wonder about things like Limonene. Like, that's really a really cool name. But is it Ayurvedic? I mean, do names have to be Ayurvedic? I mean, I guess not. Because some people call it cyanide. And some people call it nitrile. But, you know, our syllabus says to use nitrile. But still, you know, you can say cyanide. Can we not? Anyways. That's found in apples as well, I think. Sorry. Anyways, uh, terpenine, terpenine for all is one of the active ingredients in tea tree oil. What is the molecular formula of terpenine? Ah, oh, which is the molecular formula. We just have to count. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten carbon atoms. So, C10. Now, let's do H. And I'm going in the other CHO. Cho, Cho, it's like Cho Chang. And Harry Potter it reminds me of her, so then I just do Cho. Or I need to remember. I don't know if you need to do it in exact order. Maybe in higher level chemistry, find that out. And similarly to how you know, even in physics, kg, ms to the power of minus two, there's an order of writing the units, but I'm not sure about it. So I guess we learned that at higher level physics. Anyway, so one, two, three, H, four, then um, one here, one of this carbon. Five, six, seven, eight, none on this carbon, uh, nine, ten, and then eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Okay, so C10H eighteen, and then oxygen is only one. So I got C10H eighteen O terpenin four all, and um. Hopefully that's right. I mean, you know, you should be careful about these questions, but anyways, that's what I thought. Next question. <coughs> Sorry. This is the data booklet that is relevant to this question. Cool. So, 2.40 grams of propane tool. Okay, so let's just draw this. I like to draw schedule formula first, so it's a visual one, and then if I need to, I can convert it to, you know, what, I, I forgot all the names. Like, is it a condensed structural formula? Mm -hmm. Let me check. Yeah, molecular structure formula, display formula. So I guess yeah, this is the structure formula, or even for condensed structure formula. Anyways, so my favorite is skeletal. I don't know if it's skeletal. I think it's skeletal. Anyways, so you're forming proper. Wait, I don't know. I assume that because they said. No, wait, is it? Let me just check. Yeah, it's acidified potassium diagram that's oxidation. <coughs> so it is going to be proper known. Now, uh, the reaction which was in boil on the reflex of 20 minutes, the organic particles and collective distillation, the yield power was 75%. So you'll get proper known. And if you want, you can write the. um, Yeah, I'm going to write the condensed structure formula. Structure formula. So CH3, CH, OH, uh, CH3. Okay, you can put a bracket or not, I don't know if you need to. 
I haven't found actually yet a clear tube, so I don't know find that. But if I do, I want to make a distillation apparatus. Anyways, that's run random tangent. The organic product from which I don't know why it came. I don't know. I don't know we're talking about refluxing apparatus here. Nevertheless, the organic product was then collected by distillation. The yield of product was seventy five percent, seventy five point zero percent, and <coughs> that that means that what mass of organic product was collected? Well, uh, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? So. Mm-hmm. Let us okay. So let's find what the theoretical yield would be first. Okay, so theoretical yield using this data instead of the seventy five percent, I will find the theoretical yield, and then I'll use the seventy five percent later to see how much mass was collected. Okay, so I'm going to write the seventy five percent zero percent here so that I remember to use it. But first, I'm going to find the theoretical yield. So let's first find the MR of this compound. So CH3, COH, OH, CH3, so it has three carbon atoms, so three times 12 is 36. And then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight H's. So that's going to be eight. Uh, I'm fine, AR, I'm, I'm molar mass. Okay, sorry, so 16. And 16, one oxygen, 16. So 36 plus eight plus 16 is 60 grams per mole. Okay, so now what is the number of moles? N equals M over MR. So that <coughs> is going to be... 2.40 over 60, which is what? What is that? What is that? It's 0.04 um, moles. Okay, and honestly, it probably is going to be the same mole ratio because you know what was changing is basically just addition of you know, it's basically just you know we have oxygen and there might be somewhere a water in the product or something. But basically, the main thing is like you know your the main stuff things are remaining the same. So I'm you know it's quite reasonable to assume it's one to one mole ratio and Usually it is in these type of questions. Right? Uh, so yeah, <coughs> zero. You know, it's just going from this to this. <coughs> so this is also going to be zero point zero four moles. Is my point? Or you can you know do balance the equation out and check it yourself. But I, I mean, I'm telling you that it is one to one mole ratio. And then, what is the MR of this thing? It is. It also has three carbon atoms. Thirty six plus three, four, five, six, so six, and then one O, so sixteen. So thirty six plus. 6 plus 16, so that is 58. So see, it's like, yeah. So 58, and then we can find the mass of this, so that's n times mr, so 0 0.04 times 58. Uh, anyways, so 0 0.04 times 58, that is 2.32 grams, okay? So this is my theoretical um, mass, and then, so what I do is my actual mass, like, which I actually got, divided by my theoretical mass, into 100 is going to be my percentage of product that I got, right? So my yield of product is the actual mass over the theoretical mass times 100. So because the actual mass is smaller than the theoretical mass, right? Because we only got 75% yield because, you know, so that's the thing. And so now my X is going to be 75.0 into 2.32 over 100, okay? Or you could have, you know, because of 75%, so you could have made it 75 over 100 directly and not gotten it over here. That's my choice. Your, your, your choice if you whatever you want to do on your paper is is my paper. Yay. Okay, anyways. So I don't know why I'm saying such random stuff today. Forgive me. Okay. Anyways, this is going to be 1.74 grams. Okay. So that is A. Great. Next question. The diagram shows the structure of compound X. What is the product of the reaction between compound X and an excess of NaBH4? NaBH4 is a reducing agent and it's weaker than you know LiAlH4. Um, or you know, even H2, um, nickel or H2, platinum, palladium, whatever it is. So, what is the product of the reaction between compound X and an excess of NaBH4? So, basically, this, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, what's it called? Right, so NaBH4 it won't be able to reduce, um, this double bond. The double bond is really only reduced by from our syllabus H2 gaseous which is in you know, the presence of nickel catalyst, because so that's a really strong reducing agent, 
that is what's it called uh forgot what it's called like it um non i'm not exactly sure what the correct term but the concept is that it's non-preferential right so it doesn't doesn't have a preference that i will oxidize this or this it, it mostly oxidizes everything i think there might be exceptions you can check them yourself so and I'm, i don't i don't think lih lh4 can uh, reduce this as well so it's only um mostly h2 gaseous and NI, okay so anyways, that remains like that so b and c can be cancelled because those in those two it got reduced so these two are correct for now a and d now if i look at this um ketone group ketone group will be reduced so basically you will, what product you will get is um oh here or you could have made it like that but I, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much your lines bend as long as they bend so it shouldn't be like a straight like this okay but you, it doesn't matter if i bend it like this or you know my point is that instead of this part i made it like this it was or like this it doesn't matter okay anyways i don't know why i just randomly go on tangents all the time and who knows i might be wrong but that's what i know at the very least okay so uh now what product is that now over here this ketone group for some reason has not been reduced now why would it be that one is reduced and one is not that's just so random isn't it so then my answer has to be a okay so a is my answer great now Lactic acid occurs naturally, for example, in sour milk. Cool. What is the property <coughs> of lactic acid? It decolorizes aqueous bromine rapidly. Um, it does not have any alkene groups, so I would say no. Um, or nor is it, you know, what was it? Phenol, phenol, but that's more of an E2 thing, so I'm not telling you about A2. <laughs> A2. A2 is cool. I like benzene, but I just don't know how to draw hexagons properly is the problem. Ah. And well, it's hard to draw because benzene, you know, it's supposed to have equal le equal length, um, you know, bonds. But I, I, I don't know if you're supposed to draw them all equally or just, you know, people can infer it. Probably they can infer it. I mean, they do take chemistry. Anyways, it is insoluble in water. Why would it be insoluble in water? It's COOH, and you know that you have the three most electronegative atoms, F O N, bonded to H, in a covalent molecule. Then you will have hydrogen bonding, which even though the name suggests that it's hydrogen bonding it's actually you know a force an intermolecular force not a bond okay not a real bond and are there actually ever really real bonds or just interactions anyways the point here is that since this is oh so that means o bonded to h which means that yes there will be hydrogen bonding and since water which is h o h it uh, and there are lone pairs on you know this o as well obviously it's one of those atoms which are so uh, and then h o h which is also you know it has hydrogen bonding as well. So if this is hydrogen bonded and this is hydrogen bonding, that means that these can be, you know, basically this lactic acid is soluble in water. So it's insoluble in water is wrong. Okay. Now it reduces Felling's reagent, which means like, you know, that's just a convoluted way of saying Felling's reagent oxidizes. It, so Felling's reagent oxidizes lactic acid because you know they're implying redox type stuff, right? So can Felling's reagent oxidizes? Felling's reagent actually oxidizes what? It oxidizes, uh, yeah. What was the name of that thing? Sorry, uh, aldehydes. So, yeah, sometimes I forget such simple things. Aldehydes. Okay, so aldehyde. So if uh, this is not an aldehyde, it doesn't have any you know aldehyde group or anything. This is a beautiful carboxylic. Acid, it has a carboxylic acid group and it also has a, a secondary alcohol group. So there's no way that Ferring's reagent can reduce it to, to my knowledge. Uh, yeah, sorry, Ferring's reagent can oxidize it and it can reduce Ferring's reagent to my knowledge. Okay, so now there's probably the answer is going to be D, but let me just check. Two molecules react with each other in the presence of a strong acid. That would definitely be true. Why? Because in the presence of a strong acid, like for example, if you have H2SO4 concentrated, right? Okay, and you know, in um, as a reagent, like not as a catalyst, because if it's in a small amount, then it will be a catalyst, right? But if it's in a, as a catalyst, then it's going to um, facilitate the. Actually, wait, no, I, am, I, am I right or am I wrong? Um, for the for esterification, because see, what my point is that this is OH and this is COH, and that reaction between COH and OH will give you an ester purification thing right so um yeah it should actually be a catalyst so over here you're you know the strong acid is actually a catalyst so catalyst so it should be present in a small amount basically <coughs> but strong because in <coughs> concentrated okay and so yeah obviously two molecules will react each other so if you have another one as well 
so you know uh, there would be reaction between you know because it has um, what well, it has one OH and it has COH and you know you, you want if you want to draw all the product you could surely so probably will form like a ring type thing you know so this part and this part react and that part and that part and I'm sorry for being so messy but I hope you get what I'm saying drawing it I don't know I mean usually drawing rings is a bit of a hassle for me so yeah but you could try it on your own and stuff but uh, basically yes the answer should be D okay and yeah Citric acid is found in lemon juice. Whoa, what is that? I'm going to draw it out because I'm one, two, three, four, five. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. And then it has, I'm going to write a bit down actually. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and then you have this one has a COOH. And then on the end as well, it has a COOH. Other end, I mean. OH. Okay, and then C and then CH. Uh, CH2. C O H and then this one has a C O O H again and then we have C H two C O H okay that is what is citric acid so it's a symmetrical thing. Anyways, why is the volume of 0.4 moles per cubic decimeter sodium hydroxide solution? Okay, so NaOH. Okay, I don't think I really needed to draw it, did I? So if you have NaOH, you just <coughs> quite a neutralize the solution of containing point <coughs> zero five. 305 moles of citric acid. So what you have to see is what will NaOH react with. Now, if you think about OH versus COH, which are the molecules in this, um, which are the groups in this um, citric acid, I'm just going to erase that because there's no point in drawing it. I just felt like I, need, I wanted to draw it because it's fancy, okay? So now, which ones would NaOH react with? Actually, OH will only react with Na, right? But COH, because it's acid, it will give all the acid reactions. React with Na, react with NaOH, react with NaCO, Na, is it? Na2CO3, sorry. So, like, you know, all the base things. But Na OH only reacts with Na, okay? Why do I keep making this? Okay. Anyways, so basically, since it's NaOH, not Na, so this OH will not react. But this COH will react, this COH will react, and this COH will react. So, three, basically, basically, if you have one mole of NaOH, that will react with three moles of citric. Sorry, sorry, I'm doing the opposite thing. If you have three moles of NaOH, then that will react with one mole of citric acid. So you need three moles of NaOH to react completely with one mole of citric acid, okay? It's because to, to reduce like these, these three COHs, okay, to get a balanced, react back in a balanced equation. So now anyways, this is 0.4 moles per cubic decimeter, okay? And now we have, we have, um, what we can do is we can find, the, what's the M, um, wait, <coughs> let me think about this. So what volume do you, do you need, right? That's the question, actually. So V equals to N over C. We don't know the moles. We can find the moles using citric acid. So 0 0.005 moles of citric acid. If 0 0.005 moles of citric acid are there, then how many moles of NOH do we have in this one is to 3 ratio? That would be 0 0.005 into 3, which equals to 0 0.005 into 3. really important with math. It's such an easy thing. 15 and then 1, 2, 3. So that means 15, 1, 2, 3, so it be 0. 0 0.015, right? So 0 0.015 moles. Okay, so <coughs> that's how many moles of um, NaOH I have, and then V equals to N over C, right? So then N is 0 0.015, and then C is 0 0.4, and you know the units cancel out mole and mole to be decimeter. So then it becomes 0 0.015. That is 0 0.0375 cubic decimeters. And if I want to convert to cubic centimeters, I should multiply this by 1,000. So that becomes 0.0375 times 1,000. Those the options are in cubic centimeters, right? So that becomes 37.5 cubic centimeters. Okay, so that's my answer, and that is C. Right. So I hope that's clear. Next question. The drug serolimus is used to treat patients after kidney transplants. That is a very fancy drug. <laughs> A very big one. Okay, you should treat patients after kidney transplants. Wow. Um, now, on reaction with hot aqueous sodium hydroxide, hot aqueous sodium hydroxide, that reminds me of base hydrolysis or is it hydrolysis? I really don't know. Hy lysis. My mother says it's hydrolysis though. Anyways, so Sirolimus produces an equimolar mixture of two organic products. What is the structure of formula of the product with the lower vertical molecular mass? Okay, so an equimolar mixture of two organic products. Okay, so if I'm assuming it's base hydrolysis, um, 
Or could it also be like, you know, nucleophilic substitution and stuff about aqueous sodium hydroxide only could be three. Let me just new hydrolyze it first. Okay, and ester places. Are there any esters here? I see one ester. I think it's an ester. I can cut it from here. Any other ester? That's not really an ester. My God, where are my esters? Oh my God. This is no. This is bro. This is so weird. It's a big molecule that it confuses you. It manages to confuse you or me at the very least. And oh, H. What is this bond looking like? Oh. Guys, where is the other ester link? Or is there another ester link? And I'm just imagining. Is it this one? What is my problem here? Is this C C not C O equal mixture of two <coughs> Oh maybe we have like an NH link. So can I hydrolyze this somehow? And yes, we are oh I, I get it now. So actually this is yeah, this has been shifted to A2. I was not expecting to see it in Yes, okay, so when you have a C or an H, or so maybe I should make it like that, that's actually, you know, an amide linkage, which can also be hydrolyzed, right, by acid or base hydrolysis. So that also gets, um, you know, hydrolyzed, this linkage, basically, it is also broken. So that's, that's what they were doing. Again, this is an old paper, and now you don't need to worry about things like this. I don't think amides are in the AF syllabus anymore, so don't worry. I should have known, I should have known it, though, because, you know, I am, and... A2 student, but oh well, I forget stuff. I hope my teacher doesn't watch this. Well, anyways, so I'm trying to find the structure from one of the products, the lower where I do like your mask, right? So I'm gonna look at this one, which is I'm gonna highlight it. Okay, so this part, this, this part here, okay. Uh, sorry, I actually didn't highlight it properly. Like, okay, this one. That's better. Now, so I have an H there, and then this is O, and then since it's base hydrolysis, right? So instead of getting OH here, I actually get O minus Na plus because we have sodium hydroxide, so I get Na plus. Okay? And then on the other side, over here, I get H, and um, yeah, that's it because nitrogen forms three bonds, right? So this is one. I'm drawing arrows. This is one bond. Why didn't I ever use highlighters before in my videos? I should. And one, two, three. Okay, so that's just three bonds. So it should just be like this. And um, it's not acid hydroxide or anything, so it, it, this, you know, <laughs> it doesn't accept. <coughs> anyway, so NH, so that's the product you get. And so now which of the options shows this? Because the other product is obviously this big one with a very big version, like it was. So now NCO, that's wrong. NCO, NA, that's wrong. Some matches with mine that's wrong as well. So B is the answer that I'm getting. And H and yeah. So that's that's that matches with my structure. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Next question. Yay, we're finally at this section of paper. Oh, my screen is black again. I don't know why. Okay. So I, I got my screen back. Good. Uh use the book is relevant to this question. Which name is of the phosphide ion? <coughs> so I just open my QR I have my QR cable open already good. Uh, 31p3 minus. Okay, let me just check how many protons it has. 15. Okay, I'm just gonna write that there as well. And chloride ion 35 Cl minus that has 17 protons. So, okay, now which statement is correct? So, now they're talking about electrons, protons, neutrons. So let me just find out. This one it has 15 protons, and because it has a three negative charge, that means it has three more electrons and protons. So, 15 plus 3 is 18. So, 18 electrons, and then neutrons are going to be 31. Minus 15, which is equal to what? Uh, 30 minus 15 is 15, so that means one more than that, so 16. So 16 neutrons. I should really improve my math. No, but anyways, hopefully it gets better with time. 17 protons, and then 17 plus 1 electrons, that's 18 electrons, and then 35 minus 17 
is going to be uh, 18 <coughs> neutrons, I think. Yeah, 18 neutrons. Okay, so they have the same number of electrons. 18, 18, okay, that's right. They have the same number of neutrons. 18 versus 16, that's wrong. They have the same number of protons. 17 versus 15, that is wrong. So the answer is only 1 is right and 2 and 3 are wrong. That means my answer is going to be D, right? So A is 1, 2, and 3 correct. B, 1 and 2 are correct. C, 2 and 3 are correct. D, 1 and 3. Only one is correct. One only is correct. Why does aluminium chloride, Al2CO6, sublime at a relatively low temperature of 180 degrees Celsius? So, sublimation, they're talking about covalent bonds in this third one. The covalent bonds between aluminium and chlorine are weak, but in sublimation, that's just a physical change. We weaken the, you know, um, we weaken, uh, weaken, I mean, sublimation goes both directions, right? Uh, uh, solid to gas or gas to solid so really um you know we could talk about weakening or strengthening of imfs but you don't talk about you talk about imfs intermolecular force it's not about covalent bonds right so basically three is wrong which immediately means that you know my option a and option c are out okay now i'm looking at the words the coordinate bonds between aluminium and chlorine are weak again i am going to eliminate that because again they're talking about coordinate bonds the intermolecular forces between the al 2 6 molecules are weak that is right. Now, of course, you know, you do think about dative covalent, co sorry, dative covalent or coordinate covalent bonds in L2, CO6. You do, and it obviously also does have covalent bonds. The language is that they're asking about sublime, right? So you're only thinking about intermolecular forces, which means you won't consider the strength or weakness of coordinate and, you know, <coughs> the number of covalent bonds. You only think about intermolecular forces. So my answer is going to be D, okay? So that's the thing about this section. But now we don't even have this section anymore in the, you know, since 2022, but the one thing actually is that they could still ask you questions like, you know, they could give you this statement one, statement two, statement three, and then say, which of the statements are correct? A, B, C, D, they give you options and say, one, two, and three are correct. Then one and two are correct. And then they could say, two and three are correct. And uh, one only is correct, or two only is correct, or three only is correct. So they could still give you questions like that. So I would say that it's a good idea to still, you know, when you're practicing older papers to still practice this section because you could hypothetically get the type of questions that I just showed you, okay? Um, how can I run things about weird <coughs> stuff? Okay. I just like ranting sometimes, a lot of the time. Which statements are correct for all exothermic reactions? Delta H for the reaction is negative. That is true. Pretty, um, uh, that's one of the hallmarks of exothermic, I think. On a reaction path, <laughs> the diagrams of products we show where the reactants are destroyed out. So if I have reactants, and my arrow goes downwards, and then products, right? That's how I draw it for exothermic reactions. So <coughs> the products are shown lower than the reactants. That is also true. The reaction will happen spontaneously. Um, 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 actually, that's more of a, again, I think it's a more of an A2 thing, because in A2, we don't know what gives uh, free energy, right? Really change, I should say. But anyways, it depends on whether that's um, positive or negative. But the point is that um, you know it's not necessary that the reaction does happen spontaneously if it's exothermic. Could be or could not be. Okay, I guess maybe you could say exothermic reactions do have a tendency to be more spontaneous than exothermic reactions, if I'm not mistaken. But you know it's not necessary that all exothermic reactions happen spontaneously. That's not true. That's definitely not true. So the answer is only going to be one and two um, plus B. Okay, I hope my explanation made sense. It will make more sense in A2, honestly, when you do uh, gives free energy, which is a pretty cool thing, honestly. Um, anyways, question number 34. <coughs> which of these reactions are redox reactions? So let us see. 6NO plus 4NH3 is 5N2 plus 6H2. So let's see. Over here, oxygen obviously has a fixed minus 2 oxygen state. Nitrogen will therefore be plus 2 because, you know, each, you know, in a compound, overall oxidation state is 0, right? Overall oxidation state is 0. That's the principle you should always remember. So NH3, you know, uh, H has plus 1. So there's 3 of that, so plus 3 in total for uh, all the H's that are coming together. And then N will become minus 3, right? And this N2 is a pure um, substance, so it's going to be 0, pure element, and uh, natural state 0. And then H2O, the H has a plus 1, and the oxygen has minus 2, so there's no change. So is this a redox? Reaction. I see the N. I mean, this is becoming uh, plus two to zero. Plus two to zero implies that it's reducing its oxygen state, so it's becoming 
So it's decreasing in oxidation states, so it's being reduced. And then over here, minus 3 to 0 means it's increasing its oxidation states, so it's becoming oxidized. And yes, it the same substance working with nitrogen, but that's also possible, right? It's disproportionation type of redox reaction. So disproportionation, which is also a type of redox. So it is redox. <laughs> okay. The first one is right. Now let's look at the second one. SO2. So mm, O2 has O has a minus. So if you have O2, that becomes minus 4. So then S will become plus 4. O2 is 0. So then maybe I should write 4. So that's minus 2. Oxygen. And then the, oh, this O2 is 0. And over here, SO3. So this is minus 2, the oxygen. And the S is going to be, because that's minus 2 times 3 becomes minus 6. So then S will become plus 6 to balance out, right? Uh, to make the overall oxygen state 0. So now if I look from plus 4 to plus 6, sulfur is becoming oxidized. And then from zero, I'm, I'm ignoring this oxygen, right? Because it's not really changing from minus two to minus two, there's no change. From zero to minus two, it's decreasing in oxygen state, so it's, it's reduced. Okay, so that is also a redox reaction. And so I'm going to put a tick on this one as well. Now let's look at the last one. Um, okay, so SO3, now I already found it in SO3 above. And the second uh, reaction, so this one is plus six. Okay, and over here, all of this have all of these have oxygen and minus two, so I'm not going to write the oxygen, but minus, uh, oxygen. And then over here, we have sulfur as so it's just, it's SO4 2 minus, right? Or you could look at the whole compound as H2SO4, but I'm just going to do SO4 2 minus. So that is going to be S, I'm going to assume S is X, okay? So the oxidation state of S is, I'm going to assume it's X, okay? And then um, oxygen is minus two. And there are four of that, so minus two times four, and that the, the oxygen of the whole I am is minus two. So x is equal to minus two, and then minus two plus, times four is minus eight, so then if you should be equals plus eight. So x equals to plus six, okay? So this is plus six. So plus six to plus six, there's no change. Neither do the oxygen states of hydrogen or oxygen change here. Um, <coughs> there are different fixed oxygen states except for certain compounds, like I don't know, uh, OF2, H2, O3, some stuff like that, I think. But anyway, so this is not redox. Not a redox reaction, right? So then basically that means if one and two are right, that means what's going to be my answer? Uh, is it is it B? Okay. My answer is B. Okay. So that is my answer. Great, great, great. Next question. When added to water, which oxides cause a change in the pH of the water? SiO2 is a giant component macromolecule, very um unreactive with water, like it doesn't really you know, react with water much. Okay. Um it's hard to break the giant lattice and stuff. <coughs> Again, I'm sorry about the cups and stuff. Okay. But it does the job in, you know, um, hot concentrated alkaline solution, actually. So, SiO2 plus 2NaOH. I'm, I'm looking at this from my book because I found this, actually. Na2SiO3. Because it's good to remember stuff like this, and I have to revise it myself as well. So, you know, this, this proves that this is an acidic oxide because it's reactive with the base, right? Uh, basic, but um, it doesn't react with water because it's you know, hard to break the lattice. It's a giant molecular lattice, think about that. Anyways, CaO, now CaO will cause a change in the pH of water. I mean, that's quite, you know, a classic thing to know. Like, if you have CaOH twice, that's obviously a base, and it will change in the pH of water. Okay, so I'm going to put a tick for CaO. SO2, um, uh, SO2 would react with water, definitely. Uh, so if you have SO2 plus H2O, that will give you H2, SO3, which is um, it's called sulfurous acid, sulfurous acid, right? So I would assume that this also ends as acid, so it's acidic, so H2, SO3. So I would assume that this also gives you a change in the pH of the water or the solution. So that means that my answer is going to be 2 and 3, which is what? Um, actually, did I do that right? Yeah, it's SO2, not SO3, right? That should be right. I mean, or you could alternatively do the no, that's 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 the atmosphere. So I mean, why not? I'm assuming that SO um sulfurous acid form. So my answer is uh going to be C. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Halogenated hydrocarbons have many uses, especially haloalkenes or. You can bring the other I don't know. Anyways, what have halogenated hydrocarbons been used for? Monomers in polymer manufacture. That is right. They have been used as monomers in polymer manufacture. Like, um, what's, let me try to find a famous one. Not a famous one, but done at the very least. 
try to find one um what about this yeah floral floral eating so you have floral eating which is you know like this floral eating is also known as vinyl chloride right and when you make it monomer then you get sorry polymer then you get this right Which is polyvinyl chloride, also known as PVC. And PVC is uh, hard, it's used to make hard plastic, which is used in buckets, drain pipes, roofing, those type of things. And you know, when this PVC is manufactured, actually, you also, you know, when the PVC is burnt, I mean, you get, you know, toxic HCL gas as well. So, it's hard. Sort of hard to dispose of polymers and stuff in other populations like that, like actually a gas toxic produced and stuff. So, anyways, um, or should I say toxic or acidic? I don't know. Anyways, so refrigerants, I'm pretty sure it also uses refrigerants because if I think about it, CFCs, right? <coughs> They're saying hydrocarbons, they didn't say uh, it has to be an alkene or alkene, right? Anyways, uh, CFCs, so you have chlorofluorocarbons. So, those used to be used as refrigerants, but now we found that they're, you know bad for health and stuff so i guess they're not used anymore and you have alternatives like i heard the alternative is added in hydrofluorocarbons hfc's so yeah and um if i'm not wrong i mean if i'm wrong you guys can tell me in the comments kindly so <coughs> yeah and then solvents halogenated hydrocarbons have been used as solvents i mean why not why not i mean Hmm. Can I can I think of an answer? Can I can I think of any place where they have been used as um, solvents? H um, CH three CH two Cl is that a solvent? I I don't know man, but I'm assuming that they could be used for um, as solvents. Maybe there is some you know example that we've studied in our syllabus, but I just cannot. Remember it right now. Anyways, for free radical substitution, you do use, you know, like, for example, bromine in an organic solvent. I would say organic solvent. I mean, you could use it. I don't know, but I'm. I mean, why not? Why could we not use it as a solvent? Can can halogenated hydrocarbons be used as solvents? Yes, halogenated hydrocarbons. Are those in which at least one bond from the hydrogen carbon atom to blah, blah blah? These are widely used as degrading solvents. Cool for cleaning clothes, metal spray, etc. Okay, so alkyl halides are important in intermediate in synthesis as solvents in the laboratory and industry and as dry. Oh, oh, why am I? Oh, why am I so stupid? Actually, I think I we did do it in like what do you call it? Benzene chemistry. I mean, I don't know if you would count that as a solvent. I mean, do I mean, I guess solvents are reagents, right? And it, but then wasn't that CH2, CH2, CO dissolved in <laughs> water? Anyways, um, the point is that yes, so Google is saying yes, so I guess the answer is yes. Try chloroethane is a common dry cleaning solvent, so the answer is yes, okay guys? So yeah, it can be, halogen hydrocarbons can be used as solvents. In which structures do the four carbon atoms labeled C lie in the same plane? Okay, so this one is sp2. So SP2, you know, that gives you trigonal planner, right? Trigonal planner, planner obviously implies they lie in the same plane, right? Like horizontal, vertical, whatever you want to think of it as plane, okay? But anyways, planner implies one plane. Uh, whether it's just whether it's SP3, that's tetrahedral, that implies it's 109.5 degree, one angle difference. So then, you know, the, you're not actually planner. Then this one is SP3. This one is sp2. Basically, if this is sp2, then everything attached to it is going to be in the same plane as it. So this carbon is in the same plane as this carbon, which is sp2. And since and this carbon is bonded to this other carbon, which is sp2, so that they're also in the same plane. And this carbon that is sp2 is attached to this other carbon, which is also which is actually sp3. But since it's attached to an sp2 carbon, so it lies in the same plane as the sp2 carbon, if that makes sense. So anything attached to an sp2 carbon lies in the same plane as the sp2 carbon. That's the point that I'm trying to emphasize. Okay, so all of these. Are you know each, even the sp3 carbons are attached to sp2 and the sp2 are attached to each other so like all of these lie in the same plane yes they do okay now this one is sp3 
so I can't be sure about it, but then this one is sp2. So this sp2 carbon is attached to, because it's sp, sp2 because, you know, um, I'm just going to draw it here again, okay? So it has uh, three sigma bonds and then this one pi bond, right, if I'm looking at the central one. So steric number is basically the number of lone pairs and the number of um, sigma bonds, right? So it has three sigma bonds and no lone pairs. Steric number is three, which means sp2 because one s and two p orbitals are used in the hybridization, right? So that's sp2. And so the bond angle is 120 degrees and it's planar, signal planar. So this sp2 carbon in the center is attached to this other carbon, which is also sp2 because it's also double bonded. And this carbon is sp3. But as I told you, if anything is attached to as an sp2 carbon, it will um, have the be in the same thing. So this sp2 carbon is central. It's attached to this other carbon and this other carbon and this other carbon, which means that all these carbons are the same thing as well. Because they're all attached to the same sp2 carbon. <coughs> okay. This carbon is sp2, so it's attached to this other carbon that's actually sp3, but these two lie in the same plane for sure. But then we have this one, which is sp3, and this one is an sp3. So really, these, because, you know, these uh, these are all not all attached to, you know, sp2, like a chain of sp2 things, So that because this one is sp3 and this one is sp3, so we can't really say that they are in the same plane. So that means it's just wrong, like, uh, the, I mean, not wrong, but, like, they don't lie in the same plane, but the question is not answered for this one, right? Like, the, they don't, they don't lie in the same plane because it's just uh, uh, tetrahedral, it's tetrahedral, and they're not attached to any sp2. So they are in, so this sp2 is only attached to this. These two lie in the same plane for sure, but you know, these two, we don't know. So this, that means that the answer is 1 and 2, which means the answer is B, okay? So, yeah. <coughs> Maybe there's another way to solve these type of questions. If you know it, then you can tell me in the comments. Which statements about 2 methyl butane 1 over correct? So let me just draw it out. Butane. One or this time I'm gonna start my carbon chain from this side right to left, okay? <sighs> right to left, okay. So um okay, so two may have butane one over. It can give HCl on reaction with PCO5. So on reaction with PCO5, um I will get what will I get? So let me just write two plus PCO5, okay? And um that gives me Cl over here, and then it stays here, and I get POCl3. And I get HCl for sure because, um, you know, my O has went with that and Cl3. And so one Cl went here and one Cl is left. And then my, from the H from the O, it goes here. So HCl, that is definitely right. You can, you know, if you want, you can write these out as a uh, structure formula and see if they're balanced or anything about our molecular formula. But I'm telling you that this is balanced. This is the equation. And um, so one is correct, basically. You get PCl3. P O C O T and S C L okay. Now it can be oxidized to given <coughs> aldehyde. Let me draw it out and see. Um so if I oxidize it, nah, definitely not because this is a primary alcohol, right? And primary alcohols are oxidized to give you well, I mean depends. If you know you have, you have gentle warming and stuff, then first it'll give you an aldehyde, which is oh okay, they're not even asking. I thought I accidentally misread it as ketone, okay. So they're saying aldehyde. So if it's gentle warming. They're saying can. They're not saying um, is always or whatever, right? So gentle warming can give you an aldehyde, yes. And then if it's stronger warming or you can be in reflux or something, if you continue or continue warming, you know, and stuff, so then you get um, this thing. COOH, okay? So that's what you get. <coughs> because, um, you know, aldehyde is, you know, you have R, C, H, O, and you have there. And you have B and H there and R group here. Mm, it can be oxidation given aldehyde, that's right, it can be, because uh, if you have gentle warming and stuff, right? <coughs> so that's right. I don't know, I accidentally misread it as a thing, so I'm sorry about that. Next, uh, number three, it exists in two optically active form. Optically, two optically active form implies it has one chiral center. So now let me check out the molecule again. Uh, let me just draw it out. I'm just going to draw it, not draw it out again, but I'm just going to look at one of the molecules of one of the drawings I've already made. So this chiral, not chiral, not chiral, this seems like a chiral one. Because it has one H there, then one methyl group here. One, one I guess this is an ethyl group. And then I have this uh, CH2OH, right? So it has four different groups, which implies that it is, you know, a chiral center. So then um, this is right as well. So if I have <coughs> all three of them as right, then it implies my answer is A. Okay, so yeah, the organic part of this paper is quite fun actually. 
propanol and hydrogen cyanide react together <coughs> by this mechanism, nucleophilic addition mechanism, right? So that's the classic reaction of like you know ketones and aldehydes. Uh, which statements about this mechanism are correct? Cn minus is an electrophile. It has a negative charge and it has a lone pair of electrons. Obviously, that's not an electrophile because electrophile is electron seeking. It's electron deficient. It loves electrons because it doesn't have electrons. You know, you love something when you don't have it. But a nucleophile, it has electrons. I don't know why it's called a nucleophile though. Nucleo. Why is a nucleophile called a nucleophile? I'm sorry about my chat. Dan, did I spell that right? I mean, it can donate electrons, I know that, but nucleo, nucleus fellows. So it loves nucleus, right? I guess because the nucleus is. Hmm. Hmm. Just curious. I don't know. I mean, I might research a bit about that because I'm, I'm, I mean, maybe it's just a very obvious, easy answer, but you know, I, I don't think in my mind that it's nucleus, nucleus, nucleus file. But, anyways, it's, you know, it's not an electrophile. It doesn't love electrons <laughs> because it already has electrons, right? So, it is an addition reaction. It is an addition reaction. I literally wrote over here it's nucleophilic addition, right? So, it's addition reaction. We're adding the cyanide or nitrile, you could say. Um, actually, this is natural, okay. Hydrolytic bond breaking is involved. Um, yes, there is. I think this one was hydrolytic bond breaking, and um, <coughs> um is this also hydrolytic? Uh, I don't know, maybe it's temporary bond breaking, and this one's definitely hydrolytic bond breaking, also. There is hydrolytic bond breaking involved, is my point. So, the answer is going to be two and three, which is C, okay. Hydrolytic fission versus homolytic fission. Yeah, I mean that 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 probably is hydrolytic fission because yeah, there's no radicals formed, so it is hydrolytic. Then if there are no radicals formed, it obviously is hydrolytic. So I guess this is also hydrolytic, and this is also hydrolytic. Yeah. So um yeah. Anyways, the answer is going to see. So one is wrong. This is the one. No, next question number forty. 40, 40. Monopotassium citrate is used as an emulsifying agent. I don't really know what an emulsifying agent means. Define emulsifying. Make into or become an emulsion. To like basically immerse into. I think uh, I'm not sure. What is emulsification? Hmm. An emulsion is a mixture of two or more liquids that are normally immiscible, like unmixable or unblended. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So you're forcing them to like mix together. I don't know. Anyways, it's using an emulsifying agent in powdered milk and in powdered soups. Probably, I guess that's what they mean in this context as well. It may be represented by the formula shown. Which statements about more potassium citrate <coughs> are correct? It does not have a chiral carbon atom. Yes, it doesn't. Why? Because this, it, you know, this car, this carbon. Is attached to this one and this one, which are same group. So this is definitely not a carbon atom. If you look at this one, it has two H attached to it, right? C H H these two H. So then that means this is not chiral either. This one as well, for the same reason, it's not chiral. And then this one, C O O H. If I write, write it out for you, C O O H, and I'm going to represent the rest of it as R group. So this is sp2 hybridized, right? So it only has one, two, three different groups attached to it. So then it has a double bond. So if it has a double bond, that means it's not a chiral one either because you need four different groups attached. This one is not a chiral one either, this is not a chiral one either, and this is also not a chiral one either for the same reason. These three for the same reason, these two for the same reason, and this one for you know, you know these two same groups. So basically none of these are chiral, so that means this is not it does not have a chiral carbon atom. And actually I guess in some molecules, you know it doesn't need to be an organic you talk about carbon atoms with chiral, but I think other molecules can also be chiral, right? Anyways, that's not the point. Uh, it can act as a dye basic. I think, yeah, transition metals, for example. Uh, whatever, the transition metal complex. Yeah, but then those ones not so optical as far as they usually do. So, or something? I don't know. Anyways, it can act as a dye basic acid. It can act as a dye basic acid. Um, 
well di basic acid di basic acid what does that even mean like it means it has two bases and it's an acid like this is one base di basic acid hmm Let's look at this one. It reacts with NaHCO3 to give CO2. NaHCO3 to give CO2. It will because you know it has COOH and those ones give the classic reactions of CO <coughs> of um, you know acids because the carboxylic acid gives all the reactions of acids, right? So this is the base hydrogen carbonate, so it gives you CO2. Yes, it will react. So um, it reacts with NaHCO3 to give CO2, definitely, right? So you'll get CO and over here and then over here, right? And now the other thing is, I think I've got it now, because if you think about, you know, the acid-base conjugate, acid-base theory, so CH3COOH, it gives you CH3COO minus plus H plus, right? And so if this is your acid, then this is your conjugate base, right? Emphasis on base. So um, that means that if these two are the acid parts, and since this is, you know, um, the salt part, right? Like the salt of carboxylic acids that means it's basic <laughs> these are basic so if it's a di basic acid i would say yes because these two are two bases like two basic groups and you have an acid part as well so a di basic acid it makes sense a bit i guess so i'm going to say that the answer is a okay so yeah and i guess we can also look at some di basic acid in the internet if i can find them hmm. interesting Interesting, I don't know. Malic acid, diabasic acid. Diabasic acid, diacidic base. So, maybe it's okay. So, is it just like call the diabasic acid then if it has two COOH? So, that's the definition of a diabasic acid. Diabasic acid. Oh, yes, yes. Diabasic of an acid having two replaceable hydrogen atoms. So I will I will write that down in my notes too. So diabasic means having two replaceable hydrogen atoms. So we're not even concerned about the basic groups actually. <coughs> Although I guess in that sense this question is lucky because you will just get the answer if considered in even in my way. But basically it's a diabasic acid, yes, because it has two carboxylic acid groups, right? So that means that it has two replaceable hydrogen atoms. There's a CO and a CO, only two of those could happen. So that means it is a diabasic acid, yes. Okay, so this is the definition of diabasic having two replaceable hydrogen atoms um, of an acid. Okay, this is a diabasic for an acid. Diabasic acid. Okay, and yeah, so good. I learned something as well. And hope you guys, I hope you guys had fun learning chemistry with me and this was a nice paper a cool paper a chill paper i liked it hope you guys had fun too and yeah see you next time inshallah inshallah bye bye